Tan, Harvey Laverne, and your host, Stephen Nicholas. Third episode of Up Close and Personal. Uh, so this is going to be an informal interview, since we're all friends here. Um, we're going to just let these guys talk, because they have so much history. So here we go. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Joe Batan and Harvey Laverne. Hey, Steve. Hey. Hi there, world. How you doing? How you doing? I'll be very back in Brooklyn. Where, here where they I come. Was born. Here they come. Here they coming. Okay. They're coming. Okay. Feel All right. Free to call up. Don't touch that dial. That's right. <laughs> so anyway, um, I see people are starting to join, so that's good. Uh, if, if you join in late, don't worry about it. The video is going to be left up on Facebook. You can go back and watch it from the beginning. So um, we have two legends. I see. Eventually, everyone comes to Brooklyn, man. Everybody comes to Brooklyn, and uh, today I have two of the biggest legends in uh, in the music business, Joe Batan and Harvey Laverne. They're going to share their life story with you and uh, have up how they got into music. And hopefully today we're going to talk about a lot of things that have never been talked about before. So I am going to maybe just jump in and ask questions from time to time, but I'm going to let these two guys speak uh, and tell it like it is. So, um, who wants to start? I'll let Joe start. No, you're let me start. All right. <laughs> so, yeah. So, tell everybody, you know, where you were born, where, you know, where you grew up, and do uh, you have any brothers or sisters? No, not that I know of. Not that you know of. Okay. I always wanted no. to know that. I always you know, wanted you to know, know that. I'll there. tell you a story. Uh, Philadelphia. Uh, what's the, what's the, was it Convention Hall? No, not Convention no, Hall. No, it the big place where they, where they play the basketball games in Philly. The Spectrum? Spectrum. I'm in the Spectrum. I'm performing with Al Green and a couple of the acts. And while I'm getting in the dressing room and Al Green's on the other side, a guy's busting through security. No, I got to see him. I got to see him. I said, he said, Joe, there's a guy out there. He says he got to see you. I said, who got to see me? He said, he says, your brother. My brother? I don't have any brothers. <laughs> so he busts through security. Bro, how you doing? He starts hugging me and kissing me. And I said, and he whispers in my ear and he says, I'm your brother. See, my brother. He said, yeah, your mom never told you. So what? <laughs> you know, and then it turns out that he was like 10 years older than me. Um, he was a boxer. Never saw him again. Was he your brother? I went back and asked my mother. She, yeah. was, she was vague about it. Yeah, yeah. You know, he was your brother. My stepbrother. Real? Oh, your stepbrother. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. you know, so you never your know. Your brother from another mother or hey, another no, father? No, my mother from another father. From another father. Yeah, so there was, that was the only experience I had like that. So when you say, do you have any brothers and sisters? God only knows. You never right. know. Did yeah. You, did you ever see him again? No. Wow. That's no, weird. No. You know see, that's I, something I never knew. Yeah. A lot yeah. of people never knew you know that. How, there you, you go. Know, well, you know how I, They're probably looking for me now. <laughs> I thought the story was, hey, listen, don't, I'm, I'm just, I just did this to get it. No. Don't blow me. Yeah. It was right. actually uh, yeah, a true yeah. story, but that was wow. uh, one of a host of stories that uh, went with Joe Batan journey. By the way, I just finished my memoir, Steve, and of course, we're looking for a publisher, and uh, they're coming down from the Smithsonian uh, to interview me. You're uh, in the Smithsonian, aren't yes, you? Yes, I am. Yes. Thank God. I mean. I was, Unbelievable, I, man. I was called in 1910. That's heavy. Yeah, it, 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 definitely. I mean, I'm up there with Maya Angelo, right. Michael Jackson. It's I mean, you made me a picture of Portrait is there with my band. You know, so who would have thought this little guy from Spanish Harlem, Afro Filipino, would ever have been in the National Portrait Gallery of Washington? Incredible. Yeah. Can I yeah. correct you right here for a moment? Mm -hmm. You said you were up there in 1910. You meant 2010. I mean, 2010. I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you, Harvey. Because, you know, when you get up in age, you start beginning. That's okay, Joe. Do the same. Do the same. <laughs> I will. I'll correct you. I'll See, remember. this is going to be great, man, because these two guys, how, how, how far back do you guys go? We go back to, like, 1966. Right. So right. over 50 years. Yeah. You guys go back oh, over 50 sure. years. For sure. Mm. Yeah. They're good friends, too. Oh, right. It was always good with us from that's, day that, one. Right. That's, yeah. that's why this is going to be an excellent interview, yeah. because I, I'm just going to let you guys talk. You guys have so much knowledge and history between the both of you that you don't need me i'm just you know okay. hanging okay well let me ask something to answer your question you said brothers or sisters don't stop there because the interesting part is kids grandkids 
Right. Yeah, we'll get to that. Yeah, we'll get get to that. So you grew up? Well, I grew up in East Harlem, Spanish Harlem. 103rd Street? Right, 103rd Street, 104th Street. Uh, My father carried me on his shoulders from 117th Street. They had a furnished room apartment on Lexington Avenue, and we walked. And finally, we got to 104th Street, and there were a group of kids there on the stoop. And they greeted us. You know, it was another world to me. And, uh, That's right. Back back in those I days, think, man, yeah. each block was yeah. another world. Yeah, back, you I couldn't know. go yeah. onto someone's block. You might get turned out. That's man. right. Exactly. Right? Exactly. So, and here it was. Here's this, my dad, who's Filipino with chinky eyes and jet black hair. My mother's African-American from Newport News. So we were like an ideal, uh, different combination of people moving into labor, which predominantly... Puerto Rican and right, black. Right. They were token whites, but they were starting to leave the neighborhood. So when we got there, uh, they were very friendly, the kids, you know, and that's how I got to meet everybody. And then what I found out is that Joe Batan was a minority in, in Spanish Harlem because I wasn't Latino. Right. So I had to learn the language. Right. So everything I did, I played with my playmates. I learned the curse words first, you know, and of course, everything else about fighting. And I had to defend myself constantly because I had no brothers or sisters to come to my defense. And after a while, I got a reputation. And eventually, you took over the whole neighborhood. <laughs> when they, when right? They would say that, you know. You when took the over the whole over. neighborhood, man. You, well, you were like, one uh, point, yeah. I went over. You was you a tough over. dude, man. Yeah, well, we yeah. had my moments. Yeah. Of course, yeah. I wouldn't replace it nowadays because it was a part of growing up. And it's in my book, which it incidentally is titled Streetology. Streetology. Uh, it's a study of the streets. Yeah. It's something that you don't learn in Oxford, Cambridge, or Columbia. Right, you got that right. It's mother wit. That's the right. Sixth sense that you embodied with from your parents. Right. And that's how I survived. I survived the music industry. I survived drugs. I survived the poverty that was in the neighborhood and the gangs and what have you. So I came out like a, a silent warrior, you know, even though I had my water loose. Uh, I was able to survive. And of course, that in a brief as a nutshell is part of my story because after I was incarcerated at the age of 15, I think 15, 16, I studied music while I was in West Kaksaki Reformatory. Of course, I had no idea about theory or nothing. I'm self-taught. And I was determined to start music because my first idol was Jackie Robinson. But of course, I didn't uh, get anywhere close to Jackie's talents. So music came along, and I rushed to it. And of course, it, God blessed me. And I think after we had been searching with this band that I had, the youngest band in Latin music, which were 12 and 13-year-olds, um, we were making records in six months. And that's like a Cinderella story. I remember you saying that uh, one day you guys used to rehearse in a church or something in like that? In school, yeah. The people had a piano there. Right, you used to grand. sit at the piano right. and do your thing. Right. And then one day you just announced to everyone, you said, I'm the leader of this band. You know, exactly how right? it happened. I walked in and these kids were rehearsing. And I said, how dare them rehearse in my, my school auditorium, which didn't belong to me, but because I used it all the time, I was appalled that anybody had the audacity to be rehearsing there. So when I noticed they didn't have a piano player, so I took the knife out of my pocket, stuck it into the grand, baby grand, and said, I'm the leader of this wow. band. And nobody said anything. That's how we did things back then. You know, I mean, it's whimsical now, you know, it's a joke not to harm anybody, but that was the way it was done. And I became the leader of the band. Joe Batan has never been a musician. I've always been a band leader. I've always been at the, the rim of what I do. And um, and you wrote all the songs? Most of them, yes. Most of them? Mm-hmm. Most of them. That's incredible. So the, what was the first song you wrote? Well, the first song I wrote was... Um, what was it? Oh boy, I know Rafi Bagat sang it. Anyway, just one of your kisses, right? But I didn't record that first, but I gave that to him. To Rafi Bagat. Yeah, Rafi Bagat. But the first song that I did record was Gypsy Woman. And of course, on the back side was Ordinary Guy, which I did write. So that's what I was right. and really uh, known you, for. You got the idea to do that, listening to uh, Curtis and the impression? Yeah, well, what happened was my singer, who had a heavy uh, Latin accent, was trying to attempt to sing the boogaloo in English, and he had a problem with addiction, you know, and we were figuring that, wow, that's not going to make it, you know. So we were trying to explain to him, 
how to use the, the, the words when he sings them in the lyrics. And he got upset. He said, you guys know so damn much. Do it yourself. So I said, okay, let me show you. So I took a newspaper. And what happened was the lyrics of Gypsy Woman just happened to be on the piano stool. And I played these chords. And I fitted the music and the lyrics into the music. So everybody started to hear me sing. And they said, hey, Joe, keep on singing. And I've been singing ever since for the last 60 years. You know, the rest was history. So, like, um, <laughs> mu musical uh, influences. Oh, well, the first influence, influence I, my mother used to take me to the Apollo when we were young. I saw Moms Mabley, Red Fox, and all those guys. Nina Horn was my first sort of starstruck person that I ever saw. And I just fell in love with her. But, of course, my, my idol was um, Frankie Lyman. Okay, first it started with Jackie Robinson. It gave me my aggression and my courage to pursue what I wanted to do. It showed me that I had a place in this world. Yeah, not like everybody else at that time, you could understand the prejudices that were going on in the country. Uh, it sort of gave that courage <clears throat> to a youngster like me to get up off my butt and do something because nobody was going to tell me otherwise. I wanted to follow in the same path that Jackie Robinson did. Uh, after growing up and hearing Frank, uh, Frankie Lyman sing, he was he took Jackie Robinson's place. I wanted to be like Frankie Lyman and every other kid wanted. We never heard uh, uh, a kid sing that high with yeah. a high voice. Yeah, yeah. and where actually, where he got where he got that uh, understanding of lyrics and the passion that he sang with from such a young kid. Hey, uh, it's today. amazing how he right. could relate to those songs and, yeah. and make them believable. Oh, because, yeah, you know, yeah, good yeah, singers, yeah. Good mm -hmm. you know, good mm -hmm. singers tell a story. And, he, and, and they and make he, you believe he, the lyrics. And he yeah. sold it. He was a key soldier. He was a good, so he was, good entertainer. He, he was, was good on stage. He was old, way above his age. Yeah, yeah exactly. Sure. So that's why we admired him. And he was sort of like <clears throat> our Elvis. You know, this kid came out and he was our age. And uh, we wanted to follow in his footsteps, you know. And of course, after that, of course, it was Smokey. I consider him the greatest lyricist uh, at my time, you know, for things that he wrote about and the feeling that he gave to yeah. the song yeah. was another total uh, breakthrough for me. Yeah, he was just pumping songs out yeah. like crazy, one yeah. legendary songs, one oh, after yeah, another. Yeah, yeah. So kind of like the way the guys in Tin Pan Alley in the 40s, mm -hmm. Cole Porter and Irving Berlin, yeah, right. they were pumping out. Yeah. American standards that yes. would live forever, exactly. one after another. So that, and uh, Smokey was the same way. No, that and Curtis was, also. Curtis yeah, he was a great influence. Of course, after that, uh, Sammy Davis, you know, Hello, Sammy, Cole, man. all those guys helped me develop a style uh, in pronouncing my words. Uh, not like uh, a lot of the songs that came later on that you would hear on records, but didn't understand the lyrics. Yeah. So the lyrics were very important. Nat's enunciation was, yeah. was... So what I found out was <clears throat> Joe Batan was only comfortable with certain words in, to portray my story. So certain words in my song, you'll never hear me sing. You know, especially what I tried not to do was to mention the word love. I tried to describe love in different ways. You know, like, what good is the castle? An ordinary guy. Uh, I purposely stayed away from the word for love because everybody else was doing that. Until I, I wish you love. Yeah, well, that was somebody else's song. Yeah. <laughs> and then I find out that the song was a hit back in the 40s by a French guy. You know, so it had been around a long time, you know, for a long time when you do the research on these songs. So you'd be really amazed at some yeah. of these songs you might think that they're new. Yeah. And that's what gave Joe Batan this brilliant idea. I found out that my knowledge of music and the, the old standards a lot of youngsters and a lot of that generation had never heard before. So I said, well, gee, what, what, what's stopping me from doing some of those songs right. and bringing them back? And it right. clicked. I did Sad Girl, uh, For Your Love. Jay it's, Wiggins. Yeah, Jay Ed Townsend. Yeah, so I mean, this hit <laughs> the new public. Right. The new generation had never heard these songs. They thought they were new. You know, and Every generation it. goes through that. They did that in the seventies as well. They started mm -hmm. doing all these disco songs. Right, exactly. Remember? Yeah. They, they did Brazil, right? And Tangerine, exactly. And all these old songs. It's not that you know, yeah, and yeah, they, yeah. they, you know, it's, it's yeah, yeah. You know, good songs live forever. Yeah, no. The definitely. guy you were talking about that wrote "I Wish You Love" that's Charles Trenet. Yes, I did. Charles Trenet. Right. He wrote "I Wish yeah. You Love" and he wrote. Uh, 
uh, La Mer, which is beyond the sea. Well, here's a question down for you, uh, Steve Nichols. What song that was recorded in a foreign land that was number one and became number one in the States? Mac the Knife. No. No. That was written here. That was written here. Was he, it, said, it was, he said written in the, he wants to say written in a foreign land. Foreign, foreign Maybe, country. Yeah, yeah. Maybe not even in, this, in English. Yeah. In a foreign country. I Tell know. me. I got it. I got it. I got it. <laughs> what, what is it? That's a lot of no, the Dominico Modugno Italian. Volare? Yeah. Volare. Volare. And well, he how did they do it in English? He sang in Italian. Dimon did it later in English. Really? But, but Dominico Modugno. The one I'm talking about. Dominico Modugno. Dominico Modugno. Um, what's the name of Sukiyaki? Kiyo Sakamoto? Yeah, you know. Wow, yeah. good. What's that? what's that? He's the one that had a number one hit in Italian in a plane crash. Let me hear it. Yeah. What is it? They, they did it over as a disco da, song. Da, 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 oh my God! What's the name of that? Uh, I know the tip of my tongue. So what? Sukiyaki. Sukiyaki. Yeah. That was the name of it. Yeah. yeah. He died in a plane crash. What, what was the group that had the big hit here? The girls. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, I can't remember their name. Oh boy, I can't remember their name. Yeah. But yeah, they had a big hit with it. You yeah. know, I, I always wondered what he was saying when I was a kid. Yeah. You know? Me too. Because you know, either you speak Japanese or you don't. Right. You know, I don't know and what you know saying. the Japanese industry. You could get play their records, but they wouldn't play your records over there unless it was interpreted in Japanese. So you couldn't break that market. No, that's not true. Though. Back then, I'm telling you, I'm telling you. I, we found your records later on. Latin that's fine. Later sold, on, Latin music sold in Spanish in Japan. Still later does. on. Later on. In fact, you know how different Japan is. Tower Records. This Tower Records is out of business, except in one country, Japan. Okay. They they license the the guy that started Tower Records. He he doesn't have nothing to do. He licensed it. There's 18 Tower Record stores in Japan that are thriving, and a lot of them are closed. No, they're thriving. I've been there four times in the last four years, and I'm watching the history there. I talk to Shin Manyata all the time, and he worked for a lot of those record companies. A lot of them are gone. And it's not, you try to break in a record in Japan, right? It's just like when I did Rap O Crapo. England wouldn't play my record unless I gave them part of the publishing. Right. And when I mentioned that to the people in London, they're poor, they said, get out of here, Joe. I said, yes, that's how it was back then. Just like in this country, everybody tried to take your publishing. Fanya did it, right? A lot of the record companies did it. They did it to Dion Warwick. Right, a lot of the companies because of the ignorance and how the business was controlled back then. And there's a lot of those countries, they're not gonna let you just come in there and sell stuff because you're an American. Forget it. There's only three record companies left, I think. Maybe two. But ja Japan loves Oh yeah, they're the second they biggest market. American jazz. Yes. They love soul music. Yeah, yeah. no, definitely. They I love Latin music so bad. You know, yeah. I remember in the seventies when I was working the yeah. colony when I was a kid. They used to come in there all the time looking for jazz music. And at Downstairs Records, these guys used to come in and buy oh, yeah. any Motown record. As long as oh, it was no, an original right. Motown record and had a real Motown label on it, they'd buy it for five bucks and take it back to Japan and sell it for a hundred right. bucks. Right. They come for right. the any cameras. record. Right. They come for the cameras also. Right, right. My, my first album was for Atlantic Records. Fanny had produced it. Uh, uh, Jerry. Jerry Wexler heard it. You want to stop? You want to stop this? No. Jerry Wexler heard it, and uh, Jack Cook was my manager at that time. He took me over, and uh, and uh, anyway, so the first that uh, first album came out. of later grade was called Viva Soul, trying to mix Latin and soul. That's what I was trying to do. And I it never I never saw it on on CD. I, I all of a sudden I remember the album. I get a I get a call I get a call from Sergio. The piano player, who was the last? He, he died of cancer this year. Anyway, he was a J and R. And he said, Harvey, do you have your record Viva Soul in the CD? I said, No. He said, I see it right here, forty five dollars. <laughs> a Japanese, $45. A Japanese version. I said, I'll take it. That's what <laughs> he did he ever get any royalties from Japan. Ask him. <laughs> no. Okay then. No. All right, so next up to no, not, he didn't pay not, nothing. Not. Right. So let, let's talk about where you grew up and Okay, I grew up in East New York, Brooklyn. Okay, it was an Italian Jewish neighborhood. I um, 
I was that good in school. Now I realize that I had ADD. I couldn't sit still, and and also and also I had uh, I had excuse me, so let me shut this off. Okay, okay, DJ turn. This is going in now. Okay, so so uh, so um, I was I was that good in school. Lower the volume there. I get it. I'm not going to talk to it. So so uh, okay, here we go. Okay. That's it. So your parent, your your. I okay, remember so reading your father was from. My father came over from Russia when he was ten years old. Sure. Yeah, his father. His father came earlier, worked in the garment center and made money, so he he could come over with his with his mother and his brother and his sister, three kids. Okay, he he saw he the thing that that started moving them out of out of Georgia was the the police came into the classroom and shot the teacher right in front of the class. I never go back to Georgia. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. Good. So that's that was it. So wow. Anyway, and he was a sweetheart of a guy, and uh, and and my mother's born, born born in the United States of Polish parents. Okay, where was she born? Here, yeah. New York. Yeah, Brooklyn. So, uh, so anyway, uh, I'm born in 1936. One, just like you guys were talking about, it was one one black was the world, and uh, and it was a, a Jewish Italian neighborhood. Okay, East uh, New York. Yeah, totally. Oh. Pitkin Avenue? No, no, no. I was between New Lots and Doom. But Pitkin Avenue was in the was mix. the was the big hub. That was the big the big movie, the right. Pitkin Theater. The Pitkin Theater. Right. And, then, and the Chinese restaurant on the second floor was the big Chinese restaurant. Yeah. So and and so anyway, um, uh, nobody had any money. It was very blue collar. You know, my father worked in a factory sewing ladies' belts. And um uh, and my mother was a stay at home mother. Okay, and like I started to say, I was in, I was uh, in school. I was, um, I had no my brothers, brother, sisters. One ex brother. I have an ex brother. An ex brother. Okay. <laughs> I got okay. a step brother. You got a step brother. You got a, I got an ex brother that I grew up with. Okay, who's a dentist. And uh, and uh, so anyway, um, that aside, um, uh, um, um, so so I I I was no good in school. Okay, I, I just couldn't sit still, and, and well, you had creative genius flowing through your yeah, I could, I just brain. Couldn't, yeah, exactly. Restless. And, and and so I realized now I had ADD and I was just dyslexic, dyslexic. I can't even say it. Okay, <laughs> and dyslexia is a, is a bitch because the I's and the E's keep changing places, and you know, and I and if you look at Coco Records, my company, I was the proofreader. I'm a genius proofreader that that can't even spell well. It's just my I see hey, that word don't look right, you know. <laughs> and and Kuskov, I don't I'm, typos drive me crazy. So so I was we Kuskov had absolutely no typos, which is amazing. And so so anyway, so uh, my mother didn't know what to do with me, you know. And so they. Uh, Do you have a lot of friends there? Yeah, look, mostly Italian friends. One Italian. Jewish friend. Yeah, I like I love the Italian culture. The Italian thing was very good for me. I saw another culture. Different music, different, 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 uh, um, different food, different, different, different way of thinking, and uh, and 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 that was really very important because that was the stepping stone. Because when I started getting into the Latin thing, I was already, I knew how, I knew how, I was in love with other cultures, right off the bat. I even went to my mother one day and I said, "Mother, I want to be Italian." <laughs> <laughs> she said, "What are you talking about?" <laughs> I said, yeah, Ma, listen, they got meatballs and spaghetti and then they and they're having a day. Ma, the Jewish people are going, oh, my fat guy, oh, like, I don't want to be in that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so so she, um, That's funny. so anyway, she didn't know what to do with me. So her cousin was a violin teacher. So he said, let me, let me give him violin lessons. And, and he loaned the violin to us, okay? So now I got a violin. What am I doing with a violin? You can't have a band with a violin. You can't do nothing with it. You don't get no girls with a violin. And and, and I, I could. Ma, I want to play something else, ma. But she didn't have the money to buy me an instrument. So no, stay with the violin. Stay with the violin. So eventually, I just I I broke the violin and told her I fell on top of the violin. That's how I fell. So that was the end of my body. Oh, we just had Avery here, just reminded us who did uh, sukiyaki. It was a taste of honey. 
Right, thanks to honey. Yeah, thanks, right. Avery. Yeah, yeah. Is that the, the, the record that the Japanese guy wrote? No, that was an yeah. Indian group. Yeah, they, oh, did, they did Boogie Yogi. Yeah, did I played Boogie. with them in California with her because they had broken up. There was two girls. And then I played at Aqueduct Raceway with them when they had their hit record. Yeah. Yeah, very good. She's still playing. Joe, yeah. Joe, Joe, the, the record, the Bolade, in, in Italian, was so short that I, I know oh, I yeah. remember the lyrics. Oh, oh, yeah, that's that's so. I, mean, oh, yeah. I, I didn't know what I was saying. You know? Okay. That's one of those songs you don't have to and know what you're saying. There's more than one. There's more than one. What's the other song? Mostly that this had Eagle a song. Bird Humperdinck. He did a version of, of, of uh, the Copa. That is fantastic. Have you ever heard the version that he Copa did? Copa Cabana? Yeah. I did. Did. And he did it Latin style. Really? And I said, boy, I'd like to cover that. You know, I, I heard it on uh, YouTube. Engelbert was good. Man. Yeah, I think yeah, that was yeah. good, man. I think He's a good performer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah very yeah. good. Yeah. yeah. So getting back to your neighborhood, you got the violin. No, the violin was, I killed the he violin. Broke I fell on I broke the violin. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and so my father, foreman, in, in the bell factory, the ladies' bell factory, he had a son who played organ. And accordion, so he gave us an accordion. He's now playing accordion. Still not exactly what I wanted, but it was workable. Especially in those days, I was the Harvey Vern Trio. And at four, and at 13, I was always, like Joe, always a band leader. Always got to work. So the Harvey Vern Trio was a saxophone, an accordion, and a drum. And we're, and I'm playing songs of the day. You know, my first record I ever bought was Earth Angel. I loved R&B. <laughs> okay, it was crazy about R&B. It's co-written by my buddy. Gaynell Hodge. Okay. Earth Angel. Okay. Right. Right. And yeah. Google was the Penguins. Penguins. Right. Yeah, the Penguins. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. Gaynell right. wrote that. Right. I can't remember who That's else. Gaynell was in the original Platters. The original, original yeah. Platters on Federal wow. Records. I know that. Okay. That was one of the longest that. running records of all time. Which one? Earth Angel. Angel yeah, yeah, and yeah. Then the Still of the Night. Both yeah. Those records. Okay. It played for years. After Still in the night was was recorded in a church basement. Really? In Connecticut somewhere. Wow. In a church basement. Imagine that. Was an that. all-time huh? favorite of the kids. Yeah. Oh yeah. For the grind them up parties. <laughs> the second forty-five I ever bought was Johnny Johnny Ray, Frankie Ray Johnny Ray, Cry. Ooh, that's and what the I did. One, I the, little, that. The, little the little white, white cloud, cloud that cried. I recorded that. Yeah, yeah, funny man. And also, I love Black King Cole. <laughs> His Everybody music, did. His, no, but his music was for the band. Was was, was beautiful. His Nathan, trio was yeah. incredible. Yeah, yeah. So I did a lot of that King Cole song, and I started working into a Sweet Sixteens. And so when I was fourteen, I went away to the Catskills for the summer, the first time. Yeah. You know? So so talk about that. So how'd you wind up in the Catskills playing? Well, it's, it's it, that's a funny story. So. Uh, I wanted to. I wanted to be. I wanted to get away from my mother. You know, I Latin loved. music was bigger in the cast. Yeah, but I did. But I went. My first time, I went as the Harvey and Vern Trio, and it was a band that played American music. We played our Latin music like rumba, this and that, and and also some Jewish. You know, one band for a little hotel, the Hotel Lorraine. It was in uh, not the one in the movie, and and in Livingston Matter, which is just above Liberty. Okay, that's a, that's pretty much the town of Washington. So we, the three of us slept in an attic. So who were the guys in your trio? Were they from your neighborhood? Phil, da, Phil D'Agostino, or, or the, a sax player, a friend of my, my teachers, who was great, came from more like Borough Park, and the drummer was from my neighborhood. I forget his name. The first drum Italian guy. So the three of us slept in an attic, and it was room and board. I came home with a contract. Now, you know, I started was hustling. So how did you get to the Catskills? What happened? I'll tell you. Somehow I got to an attic. Somebody told me this guy is, I called the guy up. I heard he was booking bands and i said i want i got a band i want to i want to go over here i want to go to, i want to work so i went there and he and i signed it now 1936 so now we're talking night i'm born 19, so now i'm 14 years old we're talking 1950. okay i go i go there and i signed a contract at 14. yeah i signed a contract for the band I, everybody said okay whatever you do and my mother i showed it to my mother 750 a week she said, you're going, to go, you're going to go away for 750 weeks. She wasn't happy for me to go away for it. She called up the agent. And she said, my hobby's not going away for 750 a week. She got us 15, Joe. Oh, wow. That was a lot of money back then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, I can't. Yeah. yeah. And, actually, oh, and Joe, for like a 10 weeks, so you're, you're coming home with 150 bucks, $125. I was saving my money because I wanted to buy a car. 
that was my biggest thing in my life. I wanted to get a car. You know, so, uh, so what were you playing up there? Just what, what you would play at a, at a, at a, a sweet, wedding? A, at a wedding or a sweet 16. Songs of the yeah. day? Songs of the day. Some Jewish song because it was a Jewish balance. The Catskills. And, if, and, and songs of the day included some rambas and some cha chats You know? So, but a mixed bag. And, and, and my mother was in like a rooming house. We used to go, to, we used to go away. The, the, the heat was oppressive in the, in the summers. So they had rooming houses. They called them, in Jewish, it was called kuchelains. And the kuchelain was the community kitchen. Everybody at a community of, everybody cooked in the kitchen. And you ate in the dining room. So it was, that, and you had a room. That's it. You know, in a bathroom on, on, on the floor. Not in the, not One the, bathroom. Yeah. Shared everybody. by everybody. Yeah, on that floor. Yeah. So, so well, you know, I wouldn't have done well in that place. Listen, you, listen, you would have yeah. done. You would have done well. You know why? Because you get out of that hot city right. before air conditioning. That was treacherous. Look, I used to sleep on the fire escape. Right, a lot of people did. Yeah, yeah. And, I'm, and I'm afraid of height. <clears throat> and we always lived on the top floor because the rent was the cheapest. You know, right? Because so, you had to walk up, right? Yeah, of course. I, I didn't even know what an elevator. Now up. the most expensive is on top. Yes, of course. Right? Yeah. 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 Well, but then I'm walking up. There's a difference. The walking had something to do with it. So, uh, so that was it. And then. And, and then, what were you doing? You were playing what? I was I was playing regular music. I'm no, like, what were you playing? An instrument? Accordion. 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 Yeah, was like, that was a big instrument back then. Yeah. Was, in the fifties, yeah, Teddy Randazzo with the, with the chuckles playing right, accordion. Right, you know, Who was that one guy, that real famous guy, the, the accordion player? I, I know who you're talking. He's about. always on Ed Sullivan. Yeah, 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 yeah. I forget the name. Can't remember. His I name. forget names at this age. Right? Yeah, but, but was, now you were doing good with the names. I mean, you hit me with names. Both of you hit me with names. So, so, and and anyway, I'm I'll, I'm going to finish my part. We'll go back to Joe. So. On the other side now, so you you, you have my, my RMD side and whatever. On the other side was the Latin thing. My father was Russian, but the whole everybody was Puerto Rican in that in that factory where he was selling belts. So Puerto Ricans at work, they got the radio blasted, they got the food, <clears> whatever. <throat> and my father would be coming home singing songs in Spanish, like Ojos Verdes. And he don't know what he was saying. I didn't know what he was saying. I liked it. Listen, a mucho, and um, and and then we started going to we they became friends, and we started going to Latino homes for parties, and I, now I'm hearing the real deal. You know, that's where the kids today, even if they don't like Latin music, even if they're in reggae's home or whatever, when they go to the family parties, they're gonna hear the real deal. Right. You know, I just those are great them. parties back then. I, yeah, and I just hope so. Somewhere, some of them, one of them will pick it up and revive that South thing. You know, because they don't, they know what it is. They hear it at grandma's house. They hear it at mom and dad's house. You know, it's just not their thing. Just like the South Side that we did, and and the, and the and the and the bilingual music that we did, because we were Latin soul. Joe and I were really. In the you guys and basically I, started that, I right? Know, Latin Latin soul music. Yeah, it was around. I mean. Other people no, had done it, but we probably embellished it. Was there anyone who was before you? Well, first of all, you got to understand, Moreno did it really early with Watusi. Right. Then Hector Rivera came at the party. Then, of course, you always had Joe Cuba with Bang Bang. And but that was, was the, like, that was the 60s, right? Yeah. That was the yeah. early 60s, Joe. early to mid 60s. Right. Right. No, no, Joe, Joe was 50s, late 50s. Joe Cuba. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And he was, and he was the father. Of, he was the father. I have a few records of his on Rainbow Records. He recorded on Rainbow Records. Oh yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah, he did the the uh, the uh, the original version of Mambo of the Times. Oh really? It was okay, on I got Rain that. Was yeah. on Rainbow Records. I heard that. I, yes. I heard it. Yeah. and it's Rainbow different. Rainbow. Yeah. it's different. It's nice. But well, that's that's uh, Woody. Woody wrote that. Yeah. No, Woody no, wrote, no, yeah. no. Woody Torres sang it. Yeah, I'm not. He wrote, wrote it too. I think Nick, Nicky wrote. Nicky wrote. Both of them wrote. They both from wrote. And, yeah. and back Sean then, Sean yeah. Sean yeah. yeah. Back then, he was called Joe Cuba and his Cha Cha Boys. Right. And you want to? And you know what? And Mambo of the Times. But I love that song. That's a great song. Man. And, and you know what? And he, his, his manager was my manager at that time, Sid Sayer. I worked up the road. My first big gig was the Brickmans. So I used to go listen to Joe Ben every night. That's where I got involved with the vibes. And uh, 
And but he used they used to sing it at the Pines. They used to sing it Mambo of the Pines. Right, exactly. Okay, Joe instead of Mambo. Well, yeah, of the I think, matter of fact, I think his name wasn't even Joe Cuba when he had his band. He changed that later, didn't he? But yeah, he had yeah, different. But by nineteen fifty six, I don't know when he changed it. But when I'm talking about nineteen fifty six, he was Joe Cuba. Okay, for sure. Okay, and I and I was at the hotel band. I used to go listen to him every night, and and that's how I got. I started to really understand. The Latin. And and you know what they were Joe was really, you know some of these songs were not Latin soul. They were really salsa in English. Some of these songs that we're talking about here. And that was the breakthrough. Yeah, because yes, yeah. You hadn't heard anybody attempt to do so Latin songs in English. In English yeah, you know, right, because right. he had that core group. Now you got to think these were the happiest cats in Latin music from a different era. Now when you talk about Jimmy Sabater, you talking about Willie Torres and Joe Cuba. You couldn't get three guys that were more happy and into the neighborhood. Okay. You got to understand, growing up in East Harlem, there were different type of people that came from the island, and there were those that were reared okay. right Joe. there in New York. Joe and these guys were reared right let there, me and they knew. Let, let me include you know? the East. And Cheo from Luciano? Well, Cheo came later. He yeah. came later. Cheo came let, let, there was let, me include, let me include who really was a rock in that band, Nicky. Yeah, with Nicky, Nicky wrote, and and wrote a lot of the songs, did a lot of the arrangements. Mm -hmm. Slim was the bass player. Right. And the vibe player, I forget his name. Yeah, Nicky wrote right. To Be With You. Did he Willie. write that? To Be With You. Uh, Willie, Willie. Because Willie's the first one to sing it. No. To Be With You, Jimmy Sabatier. Harvey, you got money, you're going to lose it. The first one to record To Be With You is Willie Torres. I'm surprised you don't know this. Right? Let it, let somebody will answer or I didn't find out. All the people knew is that Jimmy is responsible for the big hit. But before he did it, Willie Torres recorded that song. Yeah, a lot of people okay. don't know. Okay. Yeah, but well, you, can, heard you can check me on history. You know? Okay. And that was, that was probably the biggest bolero yeah, of all that's time. That's why I that say Willie Torres was very influential. He was one of them hip cats that sang doo-wop in the streets. Right. right. He could do Latin also. You see, but there weren't too many people that could do both. Well, he's well, he's, well, he's in his 90s now. He's, yeah. And he's, and he's, 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 his health is, mm -hmm. well, you, know, you know, but but now he's starting to feel a little better. And he was singing his last year. He was singing. <laughs> he was still singing. Now, Jim, now, Jim, and Jim, now Jimmy's written that record, To Be With You by Jimmy Sabater. All the history aside, that record, was the record that that influenced me to write my first song, My Dream, and the, and and that and I had my deal with Fanny. It turned out to be, give me three of those. Those were the money songs. And the boleros. Then, yeah, the bolero <clears throat> cha chas, and then Harvey do whatever you want with the rest. That would, you got to give me three in every album. And who'd you speak to there? Who was in charge of Fanny? Well, I was running Fanny when Jerry when, when when Jerry was still a lawyer. Jerry Masucci. Yeah, and he was funneling the money from the law practice in Cuba, and 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 we ha had an office in, in in the law suite of. Find your records. We had an office downtown within the law. He 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 was smart. He said, I want I, I don't want to have go. I don't want overhead. I want to put all the money into family. I believe in him, and I want to get out of this law stuff. I don't like him. And 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 I met him the way I met him. I was I was in the home renovation. Business. I thought it was always Pacheco's company at first, right? And then something happened in court. No, I don't think then so. Then he gave no, it no, over no, to that's, Jerry. That's, that's not the story. Joe. You gotta look into that history. Okay, <laughs> no, Joe, <laughs> behind Joe. the scenes. Joe, right? I'm no, telling no, you, Joe, 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 Joe. Okay, don't change this. <laughs> that changed the, the history. The way the way the, the way it happened was Jerry was a lawyer. Johnny Johnny Pacheco came. For divorce, that's how they met. Okay, he was divorcing Mona. He was living in Springs. So, so, his, so his wife did him a favor. Okay, okay, that, that's how they met. And 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 uh, and Jerry was the kind of guy who had invested in anything. He invested in pool rooms. He invested in bowling alley. He was he was. He, I learned that from him. He got all this money from. The, he didn't have a lot of money. To, uh, Alex tells me. Alex Masucci, his brother, tells me. He borrowed five thousand dollars from his mother and father to put it to funny. Okay, there was a fortune back then. 
five grand. Well, he told him mid sixties, but he was making money. But he, with his look, law practice, the point was he was not afraid to invest. I went with him to Ibiza. He would go, he buy a couple of apartments. You know, I grew up in in, in the culture where be careful, don't lose your money, don't lose your money. He should be, and only stay in what you know. He was different. He he didn't invest in anything, and 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 he invested in me. Listen, when I. I was in a home renovation. I was making a lot of money. Okay, back in those days, I had my own chauffeur. Larry Hollow's mother was my bookkeeper. Really? Yeah, Rose. And and Larry used to be in my band. So what do we miss? How did you get into uh, home well, renovation? We missed a lot. We, I always had a day job. I always had a day job. I never yeah. made enough for music. Right. But I was always a good salesman. I saw baby pictures when I was sixteen. I was the top guy in the in the in the in the in the, in the studio. You know, they used to, if you did a diaper service, they would give you a free eight by 10. So somebody would come say, and then a guy comes with the pictures to sell you more pictures. You know, I was number one. Wow. And and uh, my, my my mother's brothers were salesmen, so I learned how to do that. So, so, uh, so, uh, and, and to answer your question, you know, you know I thought that's how I got found my work, you know, and. Um, yeah, you gotta understand that hobbies, Life is completely different than Joe Batanz. I'm from the streets. I'm a street singer. So my knowledge and what I know comes from the streets. He knows legally about what happened to relationships no, no, and stuff no, like no, that. But no, let, me, no, let me explain you. Never no, let no, me explain no. you. Cut me off. No, no, all right? Because I was going to tell you no, but I that even before Fania was making money, all right? He, Gary wasn't doing that well, all right? And I'm not boasting, but until Joe Batanz came around and started selling records, all you got to do is ask the record stores that are still around, right? He started to make money. He made money on Gypsy Woman, Subway Joe, and the Rag in succession, all right? Nobody else was selling back then. Willie Cologne. Okay, you, you well, that's you, funny. We're going we're gonna to have an argument. No, but that's what I'm sitting there, Joe. I'm selling the record. doesn't right. matter. You're selling the record. I know I was there. You, Joe, were, you, Joe, you were not on the label. I was on the label. Bobby Valentine was first. Pacheco, and then Wooly, and then me. No, Larry Harlow came later. Larry was the first. Artist. No, he wasn't. He was the first artist. They no, we're gonna argue. It. Okay. Time for me to go home. <laughs> right? And I know the people want to know this because you're right. cutting out history. They don't want to know what everybody has been telling them, right? There's been a lot of lies throughout history. That's what's coming out of my book, the truth. All right, they won't tell you that they uh, sabotaged my music back then, took me off the radio try to literally assassinate me, right? Because I was the first artist to leave Fania, all right? Because I wasn't getting paid. Now right. that's the truth. So when you take it from there, nobody wants to hear the other part of the story that I tell. They cut me out of the documentary from BBC when I told the truth. They had everybody up there, yes, yes, yes. This was great. Baloney. They don't want to hear the truth. They're living in a dream world. That's why most of those musicians today, right, do not have health care. These companies got away with, with taking the money from these artists. To this day, a lot of those families don't get residuals that they're entitled to. This, I had to go and look for Joe Cuba's uh, kids to tell them that there's money for Fania that they're owed, right? So don't tell me all this glorified picture of Fania, which was true, they did do a lot for a lot of people, but there's also the negative side that a lot of people won't tell you. If Harvey was in the inside, I was under from the streets. And my knowledge comes from the streets and the musicians. The after effect, what, what it did to those musicians that are no longer there, that they never had the chance to tell their story or were too fearful to say it right. because they didn't want to upset the apricot. Right. Joe Batan has never been afraid to upset the apricot. And thank God I'm still here. Right. So if you told me back then, Joe, you're going to make a lot of money or you're going to live a long time. They're all gone. Joe Batan is still here. I don't need no money. Right? I'd rather take longevity anytime. Right. Right? And, and what I'm saying is not to hurt nobody, but let's tell the truth. Too long. Right. Right? The purists have tried to keep Fania on a pedestal that, oh, we only want it to be Latin music, salsa, salsa, salsa came later. There was no salsa. There was mamba, there was Cuban music. Salsa came after the 70s, after the Boogaloo and stuff. The Boogaloo saved the company. 
right. when they weren't doing anything. And then actually, gradually, uh, this nationalistic pride came and finally it became a big household name and started to making money. But a lot of people got hurt in the interim, right? And still to this day are getting hurt because you can't find anybody to get paid. It's been sold four times almost, right. all right? Cody go. Now it's in Concord Music. People don't even know what to follow through and their catalog is still selling these records all over the world. So where's the money? Right. Right? I, I'm an advocate of that. Before I go, I want the truth to come out and it's coming out of my book, Speedology, this year. You'll hear the, the truth. I mean, as far as Joe Botano, all I can tell you is the Joe Batan story and what happened with me and what I know. I can't tell you about anybody. I can't tell you about Harvey Byrne. Well, I can't tell to. you. you well, to. no, I try to tell you when you no, try no, to no, correct no, me all the no, time. No, 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 no. I didn't try to correct. Listen, you, you said you Joe, I didn't go to college, okay? You're not. I knew that. Okay, wait, wait, wait. And I, I grew up on the streets. My streets were different. Okay. The Italian, Jewish, that was Murder Incorporated. All that right. was the mafia. That was different streets. All right. But it's still, still streets. Yeah, well, okay. it, yeah, yeah, well, it wasn't white. for the minority yeah, well, streets. Like, that, we that were was, a minority. No, you weren't a minority. The, the, Not that they ran the company. Every company. We're talking street. Like, no, 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 no. Wait a minute. No, no, no. You said we you, you Every company, there. record company back then, were controlled by one faction of people, the Anglos. There was no black president up there. There was no Latino yeah, president. Okay. Yeah, 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 Come yeah, on yeah, now. No, no, Let's no, get it right. No, no. no. We, I'm not talking. You're jumping way ahead of me. You were talking no, about that. You no, no, no. Let me tell my I, story. No, no. You you said Harvey came from 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 this legal. No, I said our, our story is different. It is. But That's I, all I'm saying. But we both came from the streets. Okay, but just what okay. you know. Don't say that I don't know. No, you don't know you where say, I came from. I'm not saying, but you're, saying, a, you're correcting me on what okay, I'm saying, okay, okay. and you're saying, no, no, it wasn't like that. No, I, I didn't say know. that. I didn't say that. Well, it's on the tape. I can't, so, listen. <laughs> it's on tape. I came from the streets, okay? The different I streets than I did. Of course they were. But there, there was Italian, was tough guys, and it was Jewish people. And, you, and, and, it, and it's not about Jewish or Italian music. It's about Latino music. No, it was right. No, it was that's not, what we're talking about. No, no, it was not just about Latino music. Jerry, yeah. Fania never had no Italian music no, playing. No, we were talking about you and me starting. What are you and Fania? A record company was a thousand years away. No, no, no. no. When I started, okay, no? okay, okay. Well, but you you went into Fania, said you ran Fania, right? And and, and I'm yeah. telling you, when I was there, you weren't there. All right, when I came on the label, when Jerry Masucci came to the Boricua Theater and got me to record for him, there was only, and you're even wrong because you said that, that it was Pacheco, there was Bobby Valentin, and there was me and Wooly. Larry Harlow came after me, and you disagreed with me on that, and I said, you're wrong. Now, you say I'm wrong, so only history can tell you who's right. Pacheco. Pacheco and Jerry made the label together. Pacheco was the, the artist. Pacheco was okay. the one that started. With Jerry? With Jerry. No, no, no. Yes, yeah, yeah. Jerry came in later. Since the real story can't come out, I don't want to mention it. Is that real? I'll tell it's you right. after the program. So anyway. Yeah. Anyway. Let's uh, agree to disagree. Yeah, no. And, I, know, uh, I love him anyway. Yeah, but no. I no. had to tell him like that because... Anytime somebody interrupts you, he's actually saying, you're not right. So then I got to be proved wrong. I interrupted you about me. You so said, because you started to say, how you came in with the legalese and blah, blah, blah. No, I, no, I, before I, that, no, when no, I said that exactly Larry what, Harlow I, came I, after listen, me, you said no. No. When I said Willie Torres recorded, no, 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 that recorded was, the record I, uh, to be with you, you said I no. I never heard about that. Right, right. So that's what I mean. You don't know. But Willie didn't have the head. So, I'm Jimmy not, had the head. I didn't say Jimmy nothing had about the head. Him. I did Jimmy, Jimmy, so He just Jimmy said that Willie did it first. That's all I said. It's okay, I never yeah. knew that. That's all that's I said. I'm not arguing about that. I never knew that. You know? Yeah. I mean, that's it. You know, anyway. Uh, that's, that's uh, Jimmy had it. Of course what's they important had was Jimmy created that with, that. with Jimmy singing to be with you created that entire... People still talk about but it. But I disagree. And nobody, and nobody, and nobody, even Jimmy, <laughs> couldn't re-record it and make it a hit. Anybody that goes near that song, but you, you're, you're dead, you see you're what dead I'm word. saying, Steve? 
What's well, wrong with Jimmy that? Well, because Jimmy had such beautiful, you know, the velvet voice. I'm not arguing that. I'm saying you know? when you take away from the writer, the guy that created right. the song, and you say that wasn't important. It was the one that had Who the hit. That's not important. You just said it in your own word. You said so I'm the, it's the right, one I'm that had the but I'm a fucking recording artist. Oh boy. I'm saying Jimmy. You don't said, remember what you just said. I just you just said he's the one that had the hit, and this is it. Like the writer is not important. If Woody Torres never wrote it, Jimmy would have never sang it. That's all I'm saying. You got to give equal credit to to the people. Well, the song yeah. wouldn't have existed if it right. wasn't for him, for Willie. Exactly. That's all I'm saying. I'm not on you. You know, I mean, look, you got to even at our days we used to publicize every musician that played on the record. Right. Right. Today you don't even know who's playing. The only people on the that record. do that are the jazz people. If exactly. you listen to exactly. jazz radio, they tell you everybody that right. was on the record. So a lot of those people never get credit. Right. They die, and you never know. That's just like with the royalties and the residuals. Well, you listed all the musicians. I on tried to, but yeah, yeah, good. yeah, Fanny, yeah, man. Fanny was yeah. very good at that. You had to fight for that. Yeah, I love they, that. They would say to me, "What do you care? You're the leader." They all said that. George Golden said the same thing. What do you care? You're the leader. Don't worry about put anybody on there. That was their mentality. They were not running the companies, the the people that made the music. It was outsiders running companies for the people that made the music. Now, you can't them, dispute that. That's true. Most of them were at, back in those days were Jewish, right? I don't know. Whatever, you know, but they, they didn't look like me. A good amount. George, <laughs> they didn't look George, like me. George Goldner. <laughs> right. George Goldner. And, and, Keep on uh, going. Yeah. Matt Tarnapol. Yeah. And uh, who's the other Morris guy? Levy. Morris Levy and Morris. I'm going to tell you how, how, you had, you how some, bad it you was. You had some Latinos only companies in, in, the, in the Rainbow Records. <laughs> and Mardi the, Gras. They don't even know who they were. He, he mentioned Ray. He mentioned Ray Rainbow Records. Yeah, but they were small. They were small. To, to, and, but to, Fanny was small when it started. Yeah. Rainbow Records. You said who we call it? Joe Cuba. Joe. And the uh, original and, Mambo. Was and I'm Fly Sex Tech and some other bands. Right. They never became some big. really some right. really some really big records on Mardi Gras. Right. Mardi Gras was big. That was Spanish old too. Right. What I'm trying you to know? say, and this is Willie Colon, and a lot of the musicians are saying, right. A lot of those Allegra, companies Allegra, Allegra, during, really. during the disco era, right, and I'll tell you how sad it was. When when rap music came out, and I'm not because it was me, I had one of the first rap records ever before it even came on the radio. I worked, I worked in a community center and I saw the kids doing this. They had no name for rap music. All right? I went to the record companies and I recorded the song, right? And I said, wow, I got to do this before anybody thinks about it. I went to Prelude. I went to Roulette. They said, get the hell out of here, Joe. What the <laughs> hell is that shit? They said, you don't sing anymore? I said, this is something new. That shows you how in touch they were with the streets. Right. And because they weren't rappers, so they didn't know the music. They didn't know that this was something that was coming on until they found out when uh, Sugar Hill Gang came out, oh, get me that copy of that. And then everybody started looking for me. But what I'm saying is the same thing in Latin music. Those guys that ran those companies couldn't even dance clubbing. Right. They didn't know, but they knew the dollar. They knew if that made dollar, then let's go for it. Of course, sure. I'll invest in it. Right? And of course, it's smart. Right? But it was time for, and, and when I came along and I started to bump, uh, Yankee Stadium, because it wasn't Yankee Stadium that was the first major concert that happened in New York City. It was Shea Stadium, which I did. All right? They took my idea, talked to the musicians, told them not to play for me because I was a musician. What they were fearful of was any musician getting a whole a knowledge of the business. They didn't want you to do marketing. They didn't want you to do producing. When I went to the companies and I said, how come I'm always owing you money? They said, oh, we got to pay Pacheco for producing. We got to pay Izzy Sanaria for doing it. Well, that should have came out of their end. I said, well, wait a minute. And that's what why they all. What does have to do with you? But this is why they all started to dismiss Joe Batan. That, that was... I said, forget about Pacheco. I'll do my own producing. Forget about Izzy Sanaria. I'll do my own artwork. Forget about this guy. I'll write my own song. He said, but what are we going to tell him? I don't care what you tell him. They're not taking my money that I'm creating. I can do whatever they're doing. And that's what happened, right? So after that, I, they probably thought I got too big for my britches. 
you know? And then when I started to organize the band, some of them are not here anymore. And they weren't working. They said, Joe, what do we do? I said, you organize. So what do they do? They went back to Joe Matsuchi and said, oh, Joe Batan is starting trouble. So he blackballed me. Right? I wasn't blackballed. I was just giving them advice. And you think that they were You were trying together? to help them. Yeah. And they ratted you out. To organize like a union. Right. Right? And to this day, I still try to do that. But you see, because everybody was at odds and the companies were not run by their own people, they didn't understand what was going on. All they knew was, oh, here's, go get a brand new suit. Oh, here, you like this? I'll go two tickets to Madison Square Garden. They were happy. Right. It was tokenism. Right. Yeah. Right? And I could go on to with some of the horror stories yeah. that happened. But nevertheless, what I'm trying to say is put the history straight. If you want to do it, don't call me for an interview. Because every time I talk, people cut me out. They well, don't want to hear that. You're not getting cut out here, bro. Well, that's all you I'm can saying. Say I'm not mad at Harvey. It's just that want to some say. of these things he might not know. I never said this on any other interview like I'm saying now. But, you know, like when you get to a point at a certain age, you say, well, gee, you know, you can't, you can't live a lie. You got to tell out the truth, right? Because of the next generation that's going to come along, how are they going to survive? or recognize the injustices that are being done. Yeah. It happens It happens in all walks of life. Exactly. It wasn't all on walks it, of it, life. It's it all walks of life. And it, and I it, mean, happens, it happens in, 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 in the biggest records and the biggest, yeah. and the biggest groups. It's true. Okay. You happened have, to die in Warwick, all of them. Listen, you have, you have, you have uh, thank God she's okay. Yeah. The, the unlasted long enough that, that uh, yeah. she's fine. Well, she was lucky. She hooked up with Burt Bacharach and Hal David. Yeah, she good. was like, right. she was probably right. one of the worst singers in that family. <laughs> the greatest singers in that family, number one, was Sissy Houston. She, she, she recorded my records. She was the, the greatest singer out of the whole family. Right. And then you had Dee Dee Warwick, mm -hmm. right? These, these women could sing, man. But, but Sissy didn't want to leave the gospel field. Right. You know, she but stayed. Sissy. She stayed with sweet inspiration. To yeah. Back up I mean, look at that group. Me up too. Yeah. 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 But Dion got lucky, man, because, you know, and then came Whitney. No. And then came Whitney, who blew everyone out of the way. Right. They're all right. in the same right. family. She, 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 the, the best that, the best that. But I've always said that Sissy Houston was the best out of all of them. She made some some sense. She was incredible. Too, but but was she incredible. wasn't really concerned with like the whole being a star and mm -hmm. and having all this dough because and everything else. Why would you think that a Smokey Robinson at this age would go to Congress to try to pass laws about the injustices that were done before? And they just passed the law about uh, about some of the music that was recorded before the 1976. Old, old music, right, yeah. So now we gotta get paid. Right, right. You see, but how many of those poor fools have died, don't even know what happened? Right. Or don't even know what the hell a royalty is, right? Well, it's because up to that family, Joe, it's up to that. Well, you got to. No, be they don't know, Joe. Joe, they 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 kept listen, quiet a lot. A listen, lot of people. Nobody's going to go knocking on doors. Now, now you, if you if your grandfather was a great singer and you read about that, they just passed this law. They say, hey, maybe you get some money from me. You go to a lawyer, you do something. You know? Well, okay. You, you say that. Well, this is the real world. But there's there's no activists. In our particular thing, it's a thing that was swept over and kept quiet. If this was politics right now, you see how much coverage it's getting? But you never heard any coverage uh, uh, about music royalties. Only last thing I heard was Ronnie Spector, you know? And people are still getting about that. The teenagers just started to get some money right. back from some the Supremes just started. But there's a whole avenue of artists, past and present, that have never seen a dime. And they're still selling their records. Right. That's the great injustice. No, and they got papers to show that the artists are getting away. Because the artists didn't know any better. So what? That doesn't make, make it right. Who said it made it right? All right, but it can be changed. But yes. some people didn't sign it away. Some people, That's right. they would just say, but, but, you know. But what he said, well, most of them did. They would some come to you and say, here's $10,000 in the Cadillac. And if you come from Newport News, Virginia, like uh, uh, mm -hmm. Ruth Brown or something right. like that, that's, that's and you never saw a ten grand in your life. And a Cadillac, mm -hmm. you take it and it's, dance away, man. Right, Meanwhile, right. they're making millions from your yeah. from your that's records. Right. Here's, here's the point, and he should know this. 
because he kept from the streets. You got you get a, you got kids that have talent that come from the streets, and and they don't know anything, and all the, and and they want to be on the radio and they want to be. They're not thinking about the money, okay? So you got listen. It was it's worse than what he said. Mar, the uh, the co-writer of Why the Fools Fall, Fools Fall in Love is Morris Levy. Can you imagine Morris Levy and Frankie Wyman getting together and writing Why the Fool Out of Fools? Right. Yeah, so, so was Alan, Alan Freed. They did, did the same thing yeah. with the Moon Glows. So was Alan, Alan Freed. Freed. Alan Freed on all of Alan this. Freed oh, yeah. wrote one of the Moon yeah. Glows yeah. songs. Come okay. on, man. Okay. So, 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 so it was even worse than what he said. Because they didn't even, you had them being partners on, in the writing. You had, you had, listen, every Jerry in the Sushi, every fan of your record, said produced by Harvey Avern, excuse me, produced by Jerry Masucci and Harvey Avern, produced by Jerry Masucci, and he was, he went, he was the producer of, uh, co-producer of, of every record. If Joe broke away from that, that was a rarity, okay? And, 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 and I always told him that, what the fuck do you need that for? You own the fucking company. You're getting credit for making this whole thing happen. This whole, what the fuck do you need to lie? And be a... Like Donald it Trump. It wasn't about money. It wasn't about money. It was about ego. Like Donald Trump. Right. Right? Like Donald Trump. He's got all the money in the world. But he's, he no, cries he about... No, everything. he doesn't. Now, now he will. Because <laughs> he's making deals all over the place. He was bullshit until we got here. He wasn't even a billionaire. It'll come out when you see the taxes. Yeah. Okay? So anyway... So getting back to the, to the story here. Yeah. Um, this you never heard. <laughs> right. Hey, man. That, that's hey. why we're here. Bring out stuff that no one's never ever heard before. So you said before that who came to the theater and wanted you to record? It's Jerry Masuja, what happened? And this is a story. I'm going to make it brief. Uh, I was trying to record. I had one of the hottest songs in, in, in New York playing at the club. Federico Pagani. Gave me my first start. I played for ten dollars a man, and I was playing in the Colgate. And every time I played this song during the height of the Boogaloo, Johnny Cologne had come out with Boogaloo Blues, and of course you had all the other artists. Everybody would get up to dance, so they knew instantly this kid got something. This is going to be a hit because they could see how the audience jumped up. It was so popular that Joe Quijano, rest in peace, came up behind my back while I was playing. He says, "Hey, a hey, young man." He says, I want to get you to record that song with my band. I told him, no, I'm going to record it my own band. Larry Hollow, hey, I want you to record that one band. No, I'm going to record it with my band, the best move that I ever made. And so- and What song was it? Gypsy Woman. Gypsy right? Woman. So what happened was I was going up to the record companies and I was with Jose Cabello, booking agent. He says, I'm going to take you to the man that's going to get you to record. And of course, you know, he was known for his jewelry and booking went there and all the the big bands at that time. So he took me up to Roulette Records, and I sat there, and there was this big guy behind the desk with a big cigar, and he said, yeah, what do you want? You know, and I'm saying, <laughs> uh, and then I'm sitting there, and then there's a crowd of people around, and then it seemed like everybody that I was ever associated with came into that room. George Goldner popped his head into the door. Uh, they had Cobello here. They had Jack Hook over here. They had, I mean, everybody was there in that room. And he said, what do you want, kid? I said, well, I just want to record. Of course, this is Morris Levy. He says, so what's we'll stopping you? I said, well, they said they ain't going to play my record. So excuse my language. He said, who the hell told you that? I said, well, this guy on the radio. He said, get that creep on the radio. He grabbed the phone. He said, what do you mean you ain't going to play this kid's records? You know? Who's the radio guy? Well, don't worry. Just use your imagination. Yeah, OK. You know? And he said, look, he said, why are you waking me up at this time? He said, I'm telling you, you better play this kid's record when he wants it. Cool. He said, okay, kid, now what else you want? I said, well, I want to get paid. He said, we don't pay nobody. <laughs> I said, well, I want to get my policy. He said, what else talking to you? Right? He said, give me a budget. At that time, I didn't know what the hell a budget meant. You know, I thought you give me cash, and that's what I, that's the only thing I knew. Give me a dollar, right? He said, give me the budget. So in other words, he was telling me how much it's going to cost, and that would have been the deal. And then, lo and behold, George Goldner walks in. Hey, Morris, what's that kid doing here? I got him under contract. He said, what? And then uh, Ray Avedis walks in. Hey, I got him under contract. <laughs> I said, wait a minute. He said, but you're a wise guy. You know? He tells me, 
we're going to fix your little brother. I said, wait, you didn't understand. All of these guys were trying to crook me, right? Making me sign a blank contract. And the only thing I can do was to sign with all of them, right? But I never signed my name. I signed some fictitious name, and they were too busy to read it. He said, oh, you're a real smart ass, but we're going to teach you. Ain't nobody going to record you. He threw me out the door. So I was walking down Broadway. I said, damn, I really messed up. Now I'm going to record. Everybody <laughs> wants me. But it was a ploy on their part to get me to come back at their mercy. Right. But somehow another DJ called me up and said, look, I got a guy that's starting a record company, and he's looking for acts. I said, okay, who, who, who is he? He says, a guy named Jerry. You know, who's Jerry Masucci? He says, he says, where are you playing? I said, at the Boricua Theater in Lexington. And I said, I'm going to send him down there. So we played. And here was Jerry, who was biting his nails. It's a habit that he always had, you know. And he said, how you doing? I said, hi. He said, what do you want? He said, I like the band. That's all he said, right? I said, I want to record you. I said, OK. I said, I want to get paid. He said, OK. I said, I want my publishing. He said, OK. So I couldn't believe that he was agreeing to everything I said. I said, when? He said, next week. The rest is history. Wow. I was so nervous. That had Pacheco in the studio when Bell Tone Studios uh, and Eric Greenbaum. That I went in there and I recorded the whole album in one day. I did all the overdubbing. I played the piano. Of course, the kids didn't know how to read music, so they were, had to follow my directions. And I had directed everybody in that studio. And Pacheco looked at us like we were crazy and said, Don't you want to do the overdubbing? We come in the next day. I said, No, 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 no. I was thinking, because I had no experience in recording, that they were going to change their mind and we're going to lose my chance. I said, no, I can do it all right <laughs> now. And I sang all the songs. That's why you hear the last song, Ordinary Guy, that Joe Batan is, is rusty. It's because I had been singing all damn day in the studio. And they said, leave it like that. It sounds soulful. Right. And of course, that became the rest of history. We got, all got dimes around the neighborhood. We all went to the, the, the nearest telephones and we requested our own song. And after a while, it became number one. And then they announced on the radio, look, stop calling. The song is number one without the calls. And the rest was history. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's that a was, great story. So that's that what people story. used to do back in the day? Oh, yeah. Call up the radio station? Oh, yeah. Come on. You, we love what we did. But that was important. We couldn't get enough of it. Even the billboard, for the charge. That was always important. Calls were important. They had a thing like that in the Little Rest. Even for these talent shows on TV. Mm -hmm. Alfalfa got up there and sang, man. And they had all the little kids call up and say, <laughs> you know, mention his name. And he he wound up winning the contest, man. Look at that. Uh, yeah? Yeah, no, matter of fact, I did that in prison. <laughs> Dale <laughs> Carnegie, right? I'm not going to make my last story and give it to Harvey. We worked there and they had a class called Dale Carnegie. We know what the hell Dale Carnegie is. It's public speaking, how to win influence friends. And they will give you these pens with Dale Carnegie's name if you were the best speaker that that lesson. So it was a three-week course. So I devised a plan. I said, my little group, I said, look, we're going to win every week. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, we're going to tell your story, but we're going to inject humor in it. And this is in prison, right? So, and I said, when you end the story, you make it like a big joke, and everybody will roll on the floor like you weren't really serious. And we did that. And... Every week, I controlled that course that another guy would win a pen. And that's what we got out of Dale Carnegie, which they tell you, you'll never know what you derive from this course until years later. And actually, it works. <laughs> I'm assuming Dale Carnegie. Yeah. yeah. So that's then you works. know. That's what works. Yeah. All right. So, so then you were playing in the Catskills, Harvey. Okay. okay. All right. We'll go right. back to you. You were playing in the Catskills. Right. And then what direction did you take after that? Well, well, so I played with regular, regular bands, regular kid band music, right? regular band music, popular music. And, and uh, like you would play at a wedding, it was part of it. And, uh, now, what I start to say, my mother, my mother's very important in my life. And, uh, and um, she was in this, this boarding house, and right across the street was a fancy bungalow colony. Where, where people went, where, where people would go, um, uh, you know, a bungalow college, where people had their own house. So she talked them into booking my band on Saturday nights. Yeah. So when I finished Saturday night in Livingston Manor, 
I would get, they would have a car and we would take the band down and we'd make another 15 bucks a piece playing, playing our late show at the Buffalo College, like Sunny at 11, 10 or 11, something like that. But she did it so she could keep her eye on her little hobby. Right. She always knew there was a tendency there to, uh, to get into trouble. So what, what was your like breakthrough? Well, the, the, break, the breakthrough was, the breakthrough was that I was really, I fell in love with Latin music. And, uh, and, um, by, by, I, 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 and, and, and I started playing, that was 1950, right? It took me to 1956 to, to break, to get my first Latin band job in the mountains. But, but, but I was playing the, the Boulevard nightclub. In Queens. In Queens, weekends, while I was still in high school. That was a hot spot, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So they had the, the, the hit artists of the day. You know, Chip the Chuckles, Al Hibbler, Roy Hamilton, you know, so, 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 so. And there I was making, I think, $30 a weekend in cash, okay? Mm -hmm. And and I, I was in high school. I was driving to high school with a new car. In 1950, by 1954, I was driving a 55 Pontiac Catalina. Okay, somebody got shot, folks. Don't worry. About don't worry about it. Let me see if I should call that one. Oh, dead, dead. Don't bother with that one. That's just the cats. They, they knock over my CDs all the time. Okay. So yeah. I like that sound. I like the that in the record. Okay. So, so. Uh, so 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 uh, and and I became, they named me Harvito. So by nineteen by 1950, 50, but by, by nineteen fifty two I was already Harvito playing in clubs, Balinese. You remember that club? That was a club in Brooklyn, the Airport Lounge. That was a club in Brooklyn. Yeah, you're going the, way the, back. The band, the band box. That was just, and then Ben Massix. Ben Massix. So so. And, and and then I went, so I, so I started playing Latin music very early, but not recording, playing covers, didn't write a song, just a working Latin band. I never dreamed about recording, okay? That was the furthest thing from my mind. And you were getting known? Your band was getting oh, yeah, known? Yeah, working all the time, man. Listen, I got I got ants, and you'll see. Arvito, uh, Tito Puente, Tito Rodriguez. Arvito, Machito. I never even had a record. Meanwhile, you're getting to meet all these people. We the band did a good job, and then and then 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 the pivotal thing pivotal thing was about 1955. I come across this band led by Larry Hollow. Cojunto, two two trumpets again, also playing every other people's music, you know, and uh, and I liked it. I liked it, and and remember that now I'm a chord. By the way. I went away from the accordion. I was playing piano for when I became Harvito. Harvito. You learned piano? Yeah, I learned piano. Not to, not to pay the groove. On your own? Yeah, yeah, yeah. On my own. I took some piano lessons, but the main thing was I knew, I knew, I knew, I was, I was a groove guy. That was me. I knew, I knew how to get the groove, get the people dancing. I had a good timbali player that also played drums and, and, and a conga player that sang. And we had a nice little quartet. And uh, and and that was the Harvito Quartet, and then and then. Um, and you still hadn't recorded yet. No, recording '66 was decade away. Didn't want, didn't think I I wanted to. I didn't think about it. I was working. I had my day business. I was working up doing the beach clubs in Long Beach, Lido Beach, getting good money, getting gigantic money when I played a Jewish wedding. Because now you got a Latin band. In those days, in those days when Latin music, when Jewish people were still into Latin music, okay? When Jewish people were still into Latin music before the Beatles showed up in 1963, I, that, my band, my seven piece band, I would add just a singer the, the, to sing that, that, that American song because I was a Latin band already. And your band was growing. It grew no, from. No, yeah, we were seven piece. A trio? Band. Yeah, to no, no, we were seven piece. We're Conjunto now. And and um, but 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 Jewish people went to Latin music as much as they, they needed the Latin music as much as they needed the other kind of music for a wedding, and that and that and they paid very well for that. Okay, so 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 uh, that was that was very very strong. That connection, that Jewish Latin connection, was pretty strong. Very strong, right? But the, 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 listen, the, the Palladium. The Palladium was loaded. Look at the Palladium, the Fulton play. You got Marilyn went this a, a, a Jew. 
You got Millie Doné, an Italian. You got a lot of white people dancing. Great. She was hot. Millie Doné, right? I dated Millie. But she Millie, was beautiful. Millie, Millie was hot. And Millie danced. And the, the most famous dancer besides Rocky and Margot were Cuban Pete and Millie. So she's part of one of the legendary. Right. And then when, when they broke up, Millie and Marilyn did a thing like the like the the, the Aces, the Bombo Aces, you know. Andy, Anibal, yeah. Anibal and who was the other guy? Right. I forget. Now, Anibal was 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 Roberto Rowena's uncle. Right. Very, very important to find here also because he was a promotion man, and he also managed Roberto, and he taught Roberto how to dance, and they would get up and dance together. Roberto's funny. Those those dance. had to be fantastic but, days. Roberto Rowena, oh, yeah. Oh, my you God. Know where? Palladium. Not past by. <laughs> okay. Past by. You gotta understand. That had to be the greatest place, man. See, I play. Listen, I played the Palladium when I and I didn't have a record. That's how strong that band became. Let me tell you. Larry was very good at, at copying the music from the records, and there was the, the problem was I, I couldn't work with Larry. Larry's my. I, I was. He, Larry was would come in loaded, drunk, with a cigarette hanging, and blah blah blah. And I would say, play the let's play. Uh, um, uh, Mama Buela. I don't want to play that. Okay, let's play Caravan. I don't want to play. I said, Who's Larry? This is my band. I don't want you don't want to play. I'll tell you what, Larry. You're fired. Go start your own band. And the rest is history. Larry Horlow. Yeah. He needed to be his own band leader. Right. But, 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 but he was help. He was very helpful in the bridge. And he introduced me to Jerry. My, because he came to visit his mother and that's how I met the switch. You know, and that and that's when I when I saw it and, and that's when I and, and I didn't know anything about the leg. I didn't know anything about records. Okay? I mean I told that to Jerry. You know, I I I called for my car, James came, picked me and Larry up, took me to meet Jerry, and Jerry says, You know, we talk and he and he says, Yeah, I like you. I want, I want you to run my company. I said, Listen, I was never in a record. I was never in a recording studio. I never made a record. I don't know anything about that. Ah, you'll learn. You'll be a quick learner. Okay. So I go, I go, I go. My first day, I go to, I go to Corvettes. Corvettes. Mm -hmm. uh, on, on, in, in Brooklyn, on, downtown Brooklyn. Do you remember I mentioned that, that I shared an apartment with a guy named Spider? Right. Well, he, well, he was a buyer at Corvettes. They sold a lot of records back in the day, Corvettes. Okay, so mm -hmm. I go to Corvettes, I go to Spider, I show them whatever record I show them, Joe's record, this record, whatever record was done before I got there. And uh, and he said, well, you want, what, how many do you want me to take? Ah, oh, take 200, take 300, take 500. I came back to, to Jerry, I said, look at this, Jerry. I sold 1,800 records. He said, well, Harvey, did, did you know that if they don't sell them, they give them back to us? No, nobody told me. That. <laughs> I didn't even know that. That were records were sold on consignment. So, so I said, "What do you mean?" He says, "Like in other words, at the end of the month, if they didn't sell the records, they send you back the records, and you don't get them." I said, "No shit." No. I said, "Okay, Jerry, don't do it. I'll go." I went back to Corvettes. I reduced the order to something normal. He, Jerry, told me, he said, "Hundreds enough. They want more. We'll, we'll, we'll give it to them." So I right. didn't know the truth. I didn't know anything. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Okay, but I knew I knew how to I knew how to I knew how to take advantage of of situations. Like I go, to, I'm living on 64th Street. I go into a very expensive shoe store on on Third Avenue and and 65th Street, Jack Amantes. That time the shoes were like 300. I bump into Frankie Crock. I didn't know him. And I see him looking at some shoes, and I and I you know and and, and we didn't we didn't really didn't have to have it didn't have any really good promotion. Whatever happened with his records happened by accident or by what he did. But we didn't have a real strong promotion man that really knew how to blow out the records. Like they did with the Latin records, they knew how to blow them out. They had their DJs, they had their thing, they had their system, they had their pipeline. People were taken care of all the way down the line and, and so, so you got good promotion here. And Jerry was a good record pick, a hit picker. He had a good ear to pick the hits. He was a fan of the music. So shit, okay. So so uh, so so I'm I'm, I'm speak, I see Frank. I say, I say hello, Mr. Frankie. Blah, blah blah blah. I love your show. He was doing this was before BLS. He was WWRL AM. Right. It was the biggest 
black station in the country. And Frankie was drive time, the most important spot. Three to seven, right? So I uh, see, I said, right, you know, uh, he said, I said, I love these shoes, right? He said, me too, man. He's got two pairs of shoes. I said, I said, I told him, I said, Frank, wait a second, wait a second, guys. I told him I'm in the music business, but I didn't appreciate it because I didn't even know how to talk music then, really. I went outside to a payphone. We had payphones in those days. Sometimes they worked. Most of the time, though, I called Jerry. I said, Jerry, I'm here with Frankie Rafa. And uh, it's a shout out. I gave him a couple of records we got. You know, Gypsy Woman was the first one. And uh, and uh, and I had it in my case, so so uh, you had the record in your case, yeah. My so because I you know, you were a little tash case, I was going to go to work after the store, mm -hmm. so I had my records exercise my way. So, uh, um, I said, Play this, this uh, listen to this record, by the way. Listen to this record, tell me what you think of that. He played that fucking record on the drive time as soon as he went on, okay. Now, he now he wasn't the music director with WWRO, but he had the power. To do, to do something, and Penny ran it through through Norma Pinella, who was the music director. Mm -hmm. right? You gotta understand what Harvey's telling you was the beginning of Joe Batan because he got me on that station, which no Latin artist had gotten on there. Maybe maybe Pareto or Joe Cuba, but when he put me on there, he opened up another fan base for me because now we had the American black audience listening to Joe Batan, and that was the number one station. In the but you, but you are in the Latin arts. You are Latin soul. Right, okay. But okay. we played Latin music. That's okay, but that was had nothing to do with Gypsy Woman and WWRL. Oh, no. Okay. Now, they, they just knew Gypsy Woman, Joe mm -hmm. Batan, right? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and then I, I did, I, I produced I Want to Make It With You. Ralphie Pagan. Yeah, okay. And, 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 and but by then I was dating Norma. Norma was in a bad marriage, and, uh, and I was dating Norma. So, so I was going to, to openings, you know, screenings, and I was meeting people that I never met before. Okay, so that was nice. And same thing happened with Wanda Ramos at WKTU. Well, because of that clandestine meeting with Frankie Clark. Yeah, because, the because, because, because he knows what I'm talking about. Because you get a shot, you got to know right, how to take, take advantage of what, what it offers. That's you, right. You know, and uh, and 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 you know, and you know what broke me up with failure. And I, by the way, I love Jerry. He was no angel, but he he did a lot for a lot of people. And mm -hmm. I and I, and, and, and I'm mm -hmm. not saying anything about the bad side. And the, I, I'll talk about the bad side as much as anybody. And the, no, but the good there was side, only one side, money side. No, 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 no <laughs> everything else no, was no, good. No, 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 it's more than money, Joe. Well, I'm talking with me. Okay. With Joe Batan, okay. it's okay. money. Okay, okay, right? well, okay. That's why you're you maybe a role manager. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, 50 okay. years, right? Okay, but there's a limit to that, you know? Because really to go to 20,000, yeah. 30,000, 50,000, you got to deal with these people. Yeah. Okay? okay? But I didn't, wasn't thinking about those people, Joe. Jerry maybe was thinking about when he was going to blow out Talia. But I wasn't thinking about that. I was thinking about getting, I'm a still in street guy. I'm thinking about getting records playing. Oh, listen to my record. Oh, I got my record in, in, in Colony. You know? And, 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 and I figured you make your records from playing gigs and whatever. I wasn't, you know, like it was, I'm, I'm from the street, man, you know? And, and I'd always heard stories about that. Even the biggest guys get ripped off. You get a money manager, so he fucking rips you off. Right. You know? So just so, so get a professional. The, 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 they rip you off. Everybody fucking rips you off. Because you're, because you're, you're, you're a musician. You're an artist. You, you, you're thinking about your art and to, uh, most of your hours go into that and you don't have the hours that you know to think, uh, to think about business There's only 24 hours in a day okay listen look what happened just recently sly and the family stone sly just won an award of millions of dollars he's been sleeping in the van his right. own van he, he was that band was one of my idols you know and 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 uh and such a talented guy, he's crazy with the coke, whatever happened. The point the point was he was he was he was accommodated every step of the way because the, his records made money. And and they would do anything with for any artist. Listen, if you're an artist that don't sell, you can't get them to give you a coke, a, a can of coke when you go in the office to say hello. 
If you're an artist that sells and you're selling big time, when 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 uh, when I had my own company, Coco Records, and we went out to to to, to play a, a a concert with Eddie Palmieri. When did Coco Records start? Coco Records started in '72. Okay, uh, I, I'm, I, was, I was getting to the point of when I why, why and when I broke up with Jeff, but because there's a certain there's a certain ethical side to, to my thing that really goes very much into what Joe was saying. If you didn't write the fucking song or you didn't fucking produce it, don't fucking say you did. Okay, what do you need to rob that from a guy? You're bad enough you're gonna fuck him with his money. What the fuck? You know? That was my head. Okay. Right. Okay? And Jerry he was doing it to me. I was produced Ray Barreto's acid, produced by Jerry Masucci and Harvey of Bird. Jerry never stepped Jerry ever walked into the studio for you? Ever? Yeah. Only when it came to money. <laughs> no, no, I'm talking studio. Did he ever walk into the studio while you were? Yeah, yeah. Okay, he did a couple of times. He, he, with me, he never, I never saw him in the studio. And yeah, yeah, he was my yeah. co-producer. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's what, and he's my friend, and I'm we're traveling to Ibiza, we're going to we're hanging out for months at a time. He's a charming guy to be with, and um, and and uh, and then so, so, so I'm with these people, right? All of a sudden, one day I come in. And he's got a plaque, a gold record that I should give Doma Pinella to hang in WWR. Rafi forgot, so I want to make it with you. Maybe it was Joe's Gypsy Woman. I'm not sure. Okay? But it was while I, well, I was with him a while. You know, I take him up to the office once, so Jerry Romita. And, and I tell him, Jerry, I can't do this. And he said, Why? I said, Jerry, it's not RIAA certified. <laughs> Every fucking gold record and platinum record that often is RIAA certified. I mean, I, I, I can't do this. And he looks at and me, with, he, looks at me with such, he looks at me with such a set. We didn't have one thing that was RIAA certified. So and if they did, they weren't going to put it out. <laughs> no, that, no, they didn't have it, Joe. They didn't sell them to that kind of numbers. Okay? So, so uh, that's a real fantasy. It's still that music, okay? And, and, and I know the numbers, I sat on the books, okay? Anyway, so I say, I can't do it. She's gonna look at me there like, what are you, stupid? Anybody could go make a gold record. So he, he was so disappointed, me. he said to me, he looked at me with so, such sad eyes, like, huh? like only he could have, have those sad eyes. That's probably Joe, Joe ever wrote a song about sad eyes. It was about the sushi sad eyes. And, 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 and he, he said, I said, Jerry, I can't do it. I said, you, you just can't do what I, I, whatever I ask you to do, you can't do it. So that that day was the day that I, I never quit finding her, and he never fired me. But after that, if the, after I said, Jerry, I'm going I'm to finish, I'm gonna, because I was looking for new space for him. I had, we had space over the Carnegie Deli, which was done by a, which a guy, Dick Ricardo Sugar had him yeah. or something. Yeah. The other records was there. Yeah, and which, 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 he was probably the guy that brought Joe to Jerry. If not, it was Symphony Sid. You know, let me edge it. You know, but when but Joe said one of the DJs, that was the two that mattered in, in that market at that time. So, so, uh, and then when Jerry, Jerry, Jerry was ready to expand, I, he, he knew, he knew, he said, how oh, go, go, go find me space. And, uh, and, and I found that space for, for four dollars a foot, almost a half a floor. They were just building it, so we could design it any way we wanted. And that's why you moved in there for four dollars a foot. And that was, but I was already out. Then I was managing Ralphie for a while. Ralphie Pagan. Yeah, yeah. Got him booked to Hollywood Palladium and everything like that. And out, and I'm going to tell you a cute little story. Then I'm throw it back to Joe. How so, big was he actually, Ralphie Pagan? He was big. He was big. He was big. People still talk about him. They love him. Well, I know they yeah, still yeah. talk yeah. about him. Yeah, because yeah. anything back in those days is romanticized. Man. No, no, no. He, it was know? not only that. It was that he came out of our melting pot. Right. You know, Latin music. They had one of their own. Right. You looked up to this guy because he was a New Yorker like everybody else. Right. And he was doing it on a Latin label, and he broke through, crossed over. Latin. That's big time. Nobody right. was played on right. Rick's car station, right? Back then, ABC, get right. out of here. You, you unheard of. That was like being invited to the White House, right? right? And he and, did it. And also, he, he was Latino. He was, yeah. he was Latino. 
the show was Filipino, Latino. I was American, Latino. But Ralphie was he also he didn't do much black black music anyway. So anyway, we we worked we worked the certain the circuit of the West Coast, Holly, you know uh, uh, the Hollywood Palladium. Some some. So he was touring all across the country. Well, no, this was California. This yeah, was the Mexican thing, the right. Chicano thing. Low Joe does that now. Yeah, and and we did some little towns and some some auditoriums, some bullring, whatever, and uh, and uh, and we were staying at the at the. Uh, at the famous hotel. Hollywood. No, Sunset? No, no, no. We went there, Joe. That's with you. Give me the we're hotel. In Los Angeles? Where, 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 where John Belushi died. Oh. T t t t t t t with a T. Uh, I can't remember. With a T. Joe, name. the famous hotel that everybody talks about in LA. It's what? It's, um. Somebody will write it in. No, so no. I just can't where remember the name. <laughs> yeah. The number one hotel for rock and roll guys in Star. I thought it, it was the Sunset Boulevard. No, no, I didn't even go there. And and uh, I think it's a hotel with a T. I don't have. Someone will come up with it. Okay. So anyway, Someone will come up with it. The problem I had with the hotel, it was okay, but you couldn't dial your own phone numbers. You had to lift up the phone, and the operator would dial it for you. Took forever for her to answer the phone. Took forever for her to. After one day, I said, "Ralphie, we're getting out of here." It wasn't for me. We go to the Sunset. Hyatt Sunset that Joe's talking about. Okay, I check into the Hyatt Sunset, and and in the in the, in the lobby of the Hyatt Sunset early in the mor the morning, there's a lot of activity going on in the lobby, a lot of black activity, and and uh, and a little white guy, the uh, that I think his name was Harry Fink or something like that, nice guy. And I'm looking at this, I'm saying, what's going on here? And I so I go, so I said, what's going on here? He says, well, we're waiting, we're waiting on the Delphonics. This is the story I told you about. That, that, I, that I was going to tell you. We're waiting on the Delphonics. They missed their connection. And, and, and he says, this is, this, we, we do soul trade. Okay? And, and, uh, and Dr. Cornelius is not here yet. It could be a lunchtime. But the, we, the, the Delphonics was the star of this particular show. And, and, they, and this? they missed it. Talking probably... Okay, around 1969, 1970. I'm 70, not so great 70. with age. I'm not so great. Coco, Coco opened up in 72. I was running United Artists Latino in 71. And part of that, I'm going to guess 70. Okay? If, I, if I'm more for you. Is that the height of their popularity? What? Delphonics. That's when they were huge. Oh, man. La, la, la. Means Nobody was to, bigger than them. No, no. no well, that was the Philly sound. And their producer was Tom Bell. Right. And he, he worked with a white one. In fact, in fact, Linda I, Creed. Linda yeah, Creed, that's Linda right. Creed. Now listen, I had, I, I, Joe was in my apartment. I had a baby brand right next to the big ball, the brick ball. And I'll show you how my head is that was different than most of the guys around me. I took, I produced that record with Jack, with Black Ralph, Black Ralph. I want to make with you, did some writing with other songs. Uh, uh, I can't even remember that one. So, so. What, Ralphie songs? Yeah, yeah. I'm a, Don't I'm, Stop Now? No, no. Didn't Marty Shella do the arrangements? Marty did all the arrangements. Yeah, Marty, yeah, Marty, yeah. Marty did yeah. mine. Yeah. Great. To say I love ranger. you. To say I love you, I co-wrote with yeah, I co-wrote that song. And and so anyway, his, his, didn't want to have to do it. Just about three or four. I don't know. The, the, the point was the point was that so so uh, uh okay, let me finish this. So I tell Jerry, I want I wanna I wanna I want I wanna get Tom Bell here. <laughs> with Linda Creed to listen to Ralphie. And he says, why? I says, listen. He says, you're the producer. I says, Jerry, the whole idea is to build the biggest star you can. It's not about holding on to something. So he said, okay, go do it. I got them to come to my house. Tom Bell? Tom Bell and Linda Creed. I'm sure they had other business in New York. They said they, they came over and they played the piano and Ralphie sang and they passed on it though. Yes, you got to understand during this time, and I'm not interrupting because nobody knows it. I'm trying to give them something else. Joe Batan was at the height of his career, but this was exactly at the time that I was arguing with Fanya. Right? So his attempt was that if they got rid of me, Rafi was going to be the next. Right. Right? So economically, Jerry had done big band things with me. He got some of the best musicians in the country to back me up on those two albums, some of my best work. And uh, 
what they did with Rafi is they made a sextet. You see, so that was more economical like that and more. No, 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 that's what, that's what Rafi wanted to work with. Well, he had, okay, he had Andy, was, he had Andy. Yeah. And that's, that's what he wanted played. to work with. That's how he was playing. Andy, you, know? Know? you know, you're working with a sex set of stuff that now. You know, you can't be traveling with those big bands. You know, so. Well, so, yeah, so back then, that's what he wanted. So, any, so anyway, but for recording. It's okay. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so they passed on. Broke my heart, man. You know, I don't know why they passed on. We sang good. It's just, it's just, it they, probably wasn't the right sound. No, no, it's just they, they said they say no Delphonics level. Right. So that's had to be it. Right. You know? Okay, I'm happy I tried. Okay? But Jerry was letting me do it. And also, I sold, I took, I got Ralphie's record up to about 30,000. And, and and he was charting on the, the I want to make it with you. That's when I started managing. And, and, uh, and then I said, and then I went to Jerry and I said, Jerry, what are we going to do now? He said, what do you mean? What do you mean? Jerry, I don't even know what, fucking what to do in New Jersey. It's a big country out there. You know, he was happy with the day. He was going to live with that. <laughs> My head was, come on, man. But, so he said, he said, what do you want to do? I said, let me go sell it to somebody that knows what the fuck to do with it. We don't know. Okay, go ahead. So I shopped it in. I shopped it in. I wound up selling it to Scepter Records. You know, for seventy five hundred dollars, but Jerry wrote a fucking contract that was a killer. His contract, especially, I knew, I realized the mind that I was working with, Sam Gott, was the son in law of Florence Greenberg. They would, have, they would have a market tested record for seventy five hundred bucks, with the whole country to go, just New York. It did what it did. That's a good buy in anybody's right. market. Market tested, okay, okay. Now, now. And, and and listen to this. And and he says, okay, you know, we're going to put a full page in, you know, produced by Harvey and Byrne, blah, blah, blah. I can't wait to open up Billboard Joe for my first full page yet. Produced by Harvey Avenue. Oh, gosh. Oh, my gosh. What, <laughs> what, a, fucking fuck, guy, what a fucking man. life. What a fucking life this is. Can't catch a break. Okay. Huh? Okay. So, uh, so, a sunny like so, so. Who proofread that? <laughs> You know, you know the pity? The guy that became my partner in Coco. How's that for disaster? Okay? Okay, so anyway, it was a one-shot deal because he wasn't going to buy no. Wait, no. Cassandra says here that uh, uh, Belushi died at the Chateau Marmont. That's, thank you, sir. Cassandra. Cassandra, thanks, thank you, Cassandra. Thank you, Chateau Marmont. Chateau right. Marmont. <laughs> right. And this, and, this was, and this was like around 1970, with that old-fashioned switchboard and stuff. I just did, and thank God it was so, so so now, so we move into the into the sunset, high sunset, and and I and I mentioned, and this guy tells me about the problem with the Delphonics. I said, I mean, we don't know. We don't, listen, I got this kid here, okay? We we played the Hollywood Palladium. Look, he's charting. I we visited. We were charting on the station in L.A. I showed him the list, whatever, and he said, he said, wow. He said, and yeah, and he said, well, I said, yeah. He said, he, he said, said, can he do this? You know, we don't use beds. He said, we don't use bands. Everybody sings to the record on Soul Train. The biggest. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so um, I said, no, it's got to do with the whole group. Because Ralphie, was, Ralphie wasn't Joe Patan right. on stage. Right. Ralphie was a stiff. He was he was kind of low-key also. Yeah, I mean, you know. You know so, he wasn't so, 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 that so, animated. No, but with Andy and everything in the back, there was action going on. I liked it. So, so Andy, who and then, and then, yeah, me. what's the name that he changed when he, he was with Buzzard? Uh, Dr. Buzzard and Savannah Band, yeah, but what Andy changed his name to? He'll tell else. you, he's in okay, California yeah. right now, okay, oh, in yeah, the movies he, and everything. Are yeah. oh, you talking about what's his name? It's my boy, uh, uh, Cody Mundy, yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's, it, that's Cody, it. Cody, Cody it. Mundy, it. man. You know, yeah. what, you know, yeah. what, you know what, 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 whenever I, I can never remember what episode Ralphie was on. When, it, when I need to not call Cody, he says, 48, 38, whatever. So, so listen, see, this guy says, don't go away. Wait for Don Cornelius. Don Cornelius Don Cornelius says, okay, let's wait. Have lunch with me. Talk to me. He came in. You're probably busy all morning. Nicest guy in the world. We're talking. And, yeah. and he says, listen, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. Mm -hmm. I said, he said, but will he do it? Will, will you do it with just the record? I said, no, it's got to be the whole group. He said, I can't do that. We don't do that, man. But I figured I had it. So he said, he said, uh, man, you're killing me. He said, I'm not going to say yes. Just hang in. And then we, we were together the whole day, pretty much. 
And just at the point, at the end of the afternoon, when we were ready to go to the studio, he said, okay, I'll do it. And we really had a nice ride. So, and because he, 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 he said, okay, I'll do it. Who walks in the fucking door? The Delphonics, they made it. They made it. Now, now he says to me, he's kicking my shit back to me. He's saying, Harvey, right, listen. I really like you, man. In fact, I wish I had a guy out here working with me like you. He said, well, you know, you know I feel so good. We only use three acts. I think he said it was three. Or, I think it was, we only use three acts to show, you know? So if, 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 if he could do it with the record, which he can't, I would put an extra act just because you worked so hard and you hung with me the whole day. I said, we'll do it. Because <laughs> yeah. that was the big breakthrough. Right. You know, and, uh, nobody so ever got so on Soul Train. Right. Know? Like that's how Ralphie got on Soul Train. Then, then. Uh, so who else was on the Delphonics? Delphonics. I don't who, remember. I don't, you don't remember, remember who else. If there was only maybe one more group or two more groups, but Ra Ralphie got on. Okay. Does that clip still exist anywhere? Andy knows. Andy. Andy knows. Mundy knows. Yeah. We're friends on Facebook. I, yeah. I, I should, I, you I, know, I you'll probably hear about it, Cody, because I don't know how to get it though. Andy knows which one it is, mm -hmm. but I don't know how to get it. Okay, so oh, so yeah. now so so we do the show and Ralphie does it with the thing and then now we're on the way to Compton because we're doing some a club in Compton with uh, the Whispers or whoever I don't know about three or four and uh, and 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 and, uh, and, and Cornelius says where you, where you going I said we're going to, to to do the show in Compton he says I'm going there he says hey, stay, stay back go with me so uh, go outside he got he got a white car one of those. Two seaters with blue bull nose English little old man mm -hmm. killer. And he said, Listen, we may get stopped. If we get stopped, don't help me with your with your New York rap. Right. <laughs> okay? <laughs> don't help me. And don't work out in LA. He, 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 he says, I, I, I know how to take care of it, okay? <laughs> and he was right, because you know they start to pull over nigger and all of that shit. You're driving in a car like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What are you doing about blah, blah, blah. See, he knows that. It probably happens every day. So I thought, I want to, Joe, I was killing myself to be quiet. I, we didn't and they that. had to kill him to be quiet, you can see, right? Because, <laughs> you know, we don't hear that talk around New York, right? We don't hear that shit like that in New oh, York. Oh, it's a different atmosphere over there, yeah. you know, back then, yeah. you know. Yeah. I mean, come on. So, so anyway, so, 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 uh, so anyway, he, he comes back after a while and, and, and you know, and, and we got in a club. And it was it. And, and he gives me his number, his home number. I said, please call me and uh, let's keep in touch and blah, blah, blah. But my nature is, you know, you have a moment with somebody, your brothers for a moment. After that, I'm, what am I calling them for? I don't have a record. I don't have this. So, you know, you, 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 it's, gone, it's gone. But, yeah. I, but, but, but I wrote a little piece when he passed away. Um, my 18 hours with uh, Don Cornelius. Somewhere, if I find it, you, you know, I got it somewhere. So I'm, yeah. I'm one of my computers. Really, it was really nice. Of course, you, you got to admit that was a pretty eventful 18 hours. Of course, right? of course, mm -hmm. absolutely. So, um, so you, uh, let's get back to Joe a bit. You, you did Gypsy Woman, right? And that kind of catapulted you into the. Oh, that started everything. You know, that was the whole everything, world started right? Opening up. It was like a so that was that was 1967. 66. 66. Right. Everybody All says right. 67, but it was 66. Was it 66? Yeah. Okay. So I came in. Uh, I came in 67, Joe. Okay. That's so there were with the right. I mean, the only ones who were on the label was Bobby Valentine, Willie Colon, and me. Okay. Well, there was, we'll, we'll find yeah. that out later. Let's find out that later. I know. That's that's history. Yeah. I can find out. So then, so then, once once Gypsy Woman hit, well, we started. You know, we crossed over. In other words, for the New York market, right? Because Latinx weren't getting on WWRL. But of course, after none, that, none. You know, none. I got success successive songs on WWRL. So now, what that did is opened me up to the other side of the public in New York. Not only was I being listened to by Latinos. Black African Americans were listening to me. The white audiences were listening to me. Now my fan base was expanding because of RL, right? And they became an argument in the streets uh, uh, because I had played Latin music and that's how I started, you know? And only maybe one or two songs were done in English, 
right? So people took it for granted. He was Latino, right? And uh, the argument would go in the streets back and forth. He's Latino. No, he's not. We heard him on WRL. That boy is black. He says, no, he's not. But the thing was, it didn't matter. It didn't what matter. was the difference? Right. I love the culture. And the way I came up with it, my father's Filipino, my mother's black, but the corazón, my heart, is Latino. Right. And that's the way I live. I probably more Latino than a lot of Latinos because they never knew their history. That's right. I mean, I grew up no, in the streets. Are, I spoke are. Spanish, right? I ate rice and beans. My next door neighbors, I listened to the trios all night <laughs> long. I mean, my wife <laughs> is Puerto Rican, you know, so uh, a that, fact, that became the, the audience. The, the, girl, <laughs> the, the girl on the cover of Gypsy yeah, Woman my first wife. was she your first away, wife. Yeah. Sylvia Roman, yeah, one of the most beautiful girls in East Harlem back then, you know. Joe, mm -hmm. what, what was first? Gypsy Woman, or, or I Want to Make It With You? Gypsy uh, Woman, right? No, no, Make It that? With You came out before. Yeah? Yeah, because I told you, as I said, history, Woody Torres did that song first. See, a lot of people don't know it because you got to look, you probably can't even find a record. You know, I have a copy, right? Of, and, of, and of what? Of I Make It With You. I was shocked. No, you you, you were talking about Willie, Willie did. Torres. No, you were talking about what he did to be with you. Yeah. Okay, I'm talking about as well as so I want to make it with you. Oh, no, no, no. no, no. I'm asking you who came, who came out first. You Joe did. Oh, I did. I Joe did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Make it with make you. It with you. Right. No, 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 it was me, yeah. No, yeah, Make no, It no, With no, You okay. was a bread song. That, that okay. came out in the 70s. That came out in the 70s. That came out in the 70s. That came out in 66. Okay, and, and what happened was, see, the good thing that happened with him, with Joe, was once, one, if, 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 if the record flopped, then everything was not going to happen after that. You know, Frankie took a chance, Norma took a chance, but it didn't fly. It opened it up for everybody. Yeah, so and the next things I came up to them with, they were good, but but they were let very much open to another mm -hmm. one because of, because yeah, what it did was it established me in the community. Not only that, but it was the makeup of my group also because in performing wise. I had the youngest Latin band in music. There was nobody else the age. So what it did was that generation of kids all went to school with the kids that were in my band. They all went to Julia Richmond, Gompers, Commerce High School, and they would see them walking down the street. And they were celebrities already because they had done Gypsy Woman. And they were the youngest. They were 12, 13, 14 year old. I was the oldest. I was about 22. They were that young? That young. Chicky? Chicky. Chicky was 13, 14 years old. Chicky Fuentes. So where did he, he learn to play a trombone? He was taking lessons in school. And as I told you, I found them all getting together because we all lived in a radius of 10 blocks in the pro Carver Projects, right? And we rehearsed at Jackie Robinson, which was William Edinger at that time, on 106th Street. And I caught them in there rehearsing. And I said, what the hell are you doing here? And then I saw that they didn't have a piano player. And I said, wow right down my alley because right. I have been trying for two years to get people to listen to me. And you Nobody taught yourself piano? taught myself, yeah. Every day I would go in there and what I did is I discovered a triad, right? I was playing a C major scale. I didn't know what the hell it was. And I found out that if I separate my fingers between each chord, no, I would develop a chord. So that was right down my alley because I always had an ear. I did harmony in this. So what you had to do is move one finger. Yeah, I moved the whole triad up a step and then I had a song. And of course, that's the first song that I wrote, which Ralphie Pagan recorded on one of his albums, Just One of Your Kisses. You know, so that, that, that was history then. And then because of that band and their makeup and that they were so young, their following was the younger generation. It wasn't the older generation, it was the younger generation. So wherever we went, Polito Vega show, we were the hit of the show. The show de la Juventud on channel uh, 13, I think 47, right? And he would call me every other week to get his ratings up because kids would tune in. It was like Dick Clark right. for us here in New York. So after that, Milton Silva called me and I went on her show and I did all of these TV shows. 1967, we were voted Band of the Year. We got the award for Fred for Landala Magazine. And of course, after that, I followed the next album with Subway Joe. So then it became uh, sort of normal that Joe Batan you didn't know what he was going to do because he sang songs about the streets. Right. So what it was, I wasn't any great singer, but people identified with my music and my songs and my lyrics 
because they felt that they could do the same thing. Right. The only difference was I was doing it and they were listening. Right. That's the only difference. Right. Because I followed that up with the biggest record uh, at that time, The Riot. After I did The Riot, nobody could follow the band on stage. The way those kids, uh, I had we, we taught them how to dance with the instruments. We did a whole show tune. We used to learn that from uh, the Grand Combo. We saw them great. play in that Boston uh, Road right. Club, and we saw these guys dancing. We said, my God, none of these Latin bands are doing that. I said, well, you got it. So we incorporated that in a Latin American style, and to see a bunch of young kids doing this, so we did splits, whatever it took to do. I mean, after a while, we went to uh, the Fillmore, and we saw the Who, right? So after seeing the Who, we saw them burn guitars. I said, holy shit, that would be great because nobody's doing that in Latin music. So we bought a smoke machine and we almost burned down the, <laughs> not the Village Gate, but the other place uh, where they did the first Fania All Star album. Cheetah. No, not, not the Cheetah. Oh, the Red Garter. Red Garter. Not the, yeah, the Red Garter. No, no, what's not the Red Garter? Red Garter. Oh, down in the Village? The Red Garter was the first Fania All Star album. Yeah, you're right. That's right. That's right. It was a different. They changed the name later. But yeah, that, that was it. So I remember Symphony Sis said, "Who the hell is this kid, man? Bring all this shit in." The smoke was all over the place. Said, Get them the hell out of here. And we, ah. never, we never used it again because we didn't know what the hell we were doing. We just said, "The Who burns their guitar. They really love this shit." We thought it was caused a fire in the door run place, but our popularity was growing. Everybody followed, especially uh, that year. Jerry Masucci told me himself. He says. You're outselling every artist four to one in 1968. That's when he gave me the gold record. And uh, of course, he took me out. We went to the Apollo. And of course, he must have got money or big money residuals or whatever it was. And he said, I want to do something different. I said, what? He says, I want to record you without your band. I said, you got to be crazy. I can't do nothing without my band. You know, that's all I ever knew. And maybe I got to give him credit. He had the idea. He said, no, I want to get some of the best musicians. I don't know if he had Harvey in his ear, the other guy, the black guy that was doing promotion. But nevertheless, what he did was they got Marty Scheller, which I know was a Harvey's friend, who's a great arranger. And he did exactly what you told him. And that's the only way I would work with anybody because I felt nobody could touch my music. But whatever I told Marty Scheller to do, he did it exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I was happy. And it's the only one I ever trusted, right? So Jerry went to California. To yeah, he couldn't play anymore, but he didn't worry about it. He went, uh, he went to California, Jerry Masucci, and he was on vacation, and he came back with all these records. So he already, like Bobby said, he was great for picking out songs. So he picked out about 10 songs for me to listen to. I got these songs, and he was excited. And I, this is you. You got to do this. So he got under the street lamp. Uh, Crystal Blue Persuasion. I said, that's not me, Jerry. I can't do that junk man, you know, because I was always in the habit of singing too much. I know where this is going. Right? I yeah. Know where this is going. I always used to do too much because yeah. I did, I used to sing more words than I had to. But these songs were just a couple of words. I could do that anytime with my eyes closed. So we, we argued, and then I said, okay, I'll do half, but I got to do my half. He said, okay. That day, he hired all the musicians. Now, I didn't know who the hell Cornell Dupree, Bernard Purdy, Richard T. I mean, you know, the, the line. They're on every hobby of Bernard. Right? Yeah, that's they, my, you that's my band. Stuff. That's my band. That's stuff. But the yeah. thing is, I was using them first, right? Oh, they were on my the records. The best New York studio musicians. Yeah, so I didn't know who these guys were. And I fell asleep and I rehearsed. Eric Gale, Eric Gale. I rehearsed, Eric Gale. I rehearsed for a whole week. My voice was in top shape. Make sure I was singing a register higher, and I was ready for first. So I slept in my bed. They had the recording studio uh, session done. Move over, get the yeah, picture. Sorry. And J Jerry recorded the album without me being there because I had fell asleep. And he calls me, where the hell are you? I said, what do you mean? He says, we just finished the album. I said, you finished the damn album without me being there? And I went, I said, he said, get your ass down here. I ran. Went down to the studio. See, see what he said, what's up for a second? See what he said? Jerry didn't understand that how dare you record Joe Batan music without right. Joe Batan being there. But it was another he thing. Just, it was just, coarse. 
It was yeah, he had all the musicians yeah, there. Yeah, he had to pay them. You know? a, a, a yeah. He, no. didn't, he didn't get it. Yeah. Okay, that's the truth. He didn't get it. The Joe thinks everything is about the dollar. Mm -hmm. It wasn't about the cost. Well, it was. It wasn't not about the cost. It was he didn't know better. Well, but the okay. fact remains that he did it, and he did a good job. Well, how's he gonna do a bad job with all those good musicians? No, well, right? whatever it is, it could have something could have went wrong. But it was a new thing for me, playing with somebody else that I never played with. I've always been the leader. I had nobody else there. Again, Marty Shell, I put the music down exactly like I told him. That's the only thing that probably saved the day. That's if right, I would have right, let him do right, something right. on his own, I don't know what the hell would have been there. Go wrong. Right? So when because I got Marty knew, knew what you wanted. Exactly. And he did it. Trust me. Right. Marty's Russian responsible for Joe Batan's career just as much as Joe Batan, right, for the arrangements that he did. I mean, give him credit. When I got there, I said, holy shit. So I did the first song, whatever that was, and I sang it one time. And they said, everybody kept quiet. He said, well, well, what? He said, is that it? I said, yeah. He said, sing it again. So I sang the same damn song the same exact way. For some reason, I hit the same notes. He said, but you got to do it again. I said, why? And they said, everybody said, yeah, why? He did it. He, he did the next song, he did I it. did all of those damn songs in one or two he, takes. He didn't get it. He, did, that he couldn't could believe he right, what he heard. Right. He must have took that album home things. and listened to it for the next week on earphones by himself. And he fell in love with the song, especially the ordinary guy. The story about an ordinary guy we recorded seven, eight times practically. He did it in every kind of version because he was right. determined to make that song a hit. Unfortunately, he didn't have the know-how to bust a record. All right. But then, nevertheless, that became one of the greatest underground hits for Joe Batan in my career because it survived California, the the, the Raza picked up on it and everybody else around the world, which I never knew because we didn't have internet back then. Right. But you he know? tried it just by this point, he tried, <clears throat> he tried, he got a promotion man, which I made him get Chuck Fly, right. well, well known mm -hmm. in the business and every, he didn't do nothing for us. But but Jerry went for the money and he got us a good promotion mm -hmm. that was known by all the stations and stuff. It's just yeah. He did I didn't so see, what, I don't think, what happened during that time is that they said, we got the product, what the hell did we do? So they really was picking which song. The first they picked under the street lamp. It went on, it went top 16 in RL. Didn't bust through. Did you know that song before? No. So he, he must have heard the exits do it. Yeah. Right? Yeah, he went to California, picked up the heard, records. He, he didn't it. know none of those groups. Right. And it's so funny, the guys are looking for me now because that's one of the most popular songs today right. in California by Joe Batan, not the exits, Conway. And he has sang with me since that time. So then they picked out a song, uh, My Cloud, all right? And they played it on the radio. And something funny happened because the charts, we always used to run to get those charts early, right, to see how it moves up. I don't know about payroll or none of that stuff, but I don't think it was. It was pure sales. They went by 125th Street, so a record store. I think the Record Shack. Bobby so, Robinson? Yeah. So what happened was when the sheet came out the first week, and you could tell about records and how they jumped quickly. And my cloud jumped top 16 the first week. He said, holy shit. And then something strange happened. It jumped to number four. And after that, it fell off. So there's no reason. There was no reason why that song couldn't have went to number one, but it fell off. So I don't know what happened. It could have been, well, you know, somebody to take care of something. I don't know, but it never happened. Of course, we followed subsequently with a couple other songs, and then that was over so, until Frankie Crocker came along. So that album you're talking about is Singing Some Singing Soul. Singing Some Soul, one of the best albums Th I ever did. That heard. album is a killer, man. And, and you know what was so funny? End. I called you. Is that your first and, album on Saturday? No. Yeah, that was my soul. fourth album. I was gone already. I left. I, I don't know. I, I touch you with everybody but what was so funny about that was that that album i died now fanya was into a mode of doing salsa the joker tab was forgotten about yeah. and this album was buried under the dirt they didn't Emotion even know it was gone. there Emotion but meanwhile gone. there's a breakthrough in the west coast everybody's looking for joe Batan. why because for 20 years 
every household was playing Joe Batan, and they had never seen me until the days I was there with Ralphie Pagan. So the guy calls me, Alan Beck, who's a big promoter. He says, can you find Joe Batan for us? We want to bring him here to the Greek theater. And of course I said, wow. I was nervous because they were going to have another band. I didn't know if I could sing with another band. And I went. And then all of a sudden, they're saying, all these songs are hits. So what do you mean? They haven't played that in anywhere. And then, <laughs> this is how it has to be done. I got the brainstorm. This record is a big song. So I started selling the records. Right? I said, if they want to come to me, take me to court. Right? And we'll and, settle in court. Who told you to do that? Joe Patan's alter ego. <laughs> he said, get yours because you ain't never going to no, get it any other way. Don't you remember I said to you? Mm -hmm. Right? You remember? I, I remember. I, I remember. I said, this album's a killer, man. Yeah, I that's why I said, and I started to produce it myself. Right. And that's the right. guy got mad. I told him. I he said, said what are you doing? He says, you don't know. This is everybody. Right. And, and uh, finally, I started to release it later right. on. Right, right. But right. they had never lived. By that right. time, the damage was already right. done. Joe, when you say you. you you went with Ralphie band. Mm -hmm. Explain that to me. Okay. I, I only Ralph know you with your own band. Too. Okay. Ralphie went out to California. I went out there before him. Right? I took 50 riot albums in 1967 or 8 to sell out there. Nobody knew about Joe Batan. Jerry said, don't go to California. You can't sell records. They buy one, two records. You, you, this, everything is bad out there. I said, I want to see for myself. I want to go to Hollywood. So I went. I went to downtown. I got into a hotel. Didn't know nobody, but I found one guy's name, Ray Andrade. He was ex-Marine Congressional Medal winner, right? And he called me. He's the one that knew about me because he knew about Ray Barretta and everybody he says, Joe Batan, man, wow. Yeah, I said, I said, look, I'm trying to get started out here. He says, Well, the Chicanos, they love you. I said, Chicanos? I don't know. What's a Chicano? He says, <laughs> I said, that's I said. Could I be a Chicano? He says, hell no. He said, just be yourself. That's what they like. They like those oldies, low rider goodies. I said, right. yeah. He says, yeah. So we lost touch. And then three years later, he became this big producer of Chico and the Man. And he's looking for me to do the theme song of Chico and the Man. But he can't find me. So he gets Jose Feliciano. Right? But he finds me later on, and I covered it anyway. And I did the song, and I and so I go there, he invites me to Hollywood. I'm on the set with, him, with Freddie Prince, and uh, he just came from the Bronx. Uh, he didn't even know if he was going to get the part. The part was supposed to go to Isaac Ruiz, who's my good friend who's Mexican. He didn't get it, but they wanted Freddie for his looks and his strength. So we were there telling jokes, and uh, he says, I hope I get this part, you know. And then Ray comes up. He says, well, what's going on with you? I said, well, I'm over here. I got a record, you know, this the bottle that I did by uh, Gilbert Scott Harrod. I can't get it played over there. They told me get the hell out of here. He said, what? He <laughs> says, you're part of us, a rasa. He says, leave it to me. I said, what do you mean? He says, leave it to me. I'll get your record on. The next day, he gets a thousand Chicanos together, and they pick it K-Day. And the next thing I know, Joe Batan is all over the airwaves, and Joe Batan is on his way on the West Coast. And after that, everybody started looking for my old stuff. And they discovered all these old songs that I did. And now I became like a household name in the Chicano community. And the rest is history. I've been going there ever since. You know, frankly, I make most of my living going out to California, you know. But, and they uh, love you out there, man. Oh, they have, yeah. They, have you they told me the story. That nobody had seen me. They thought I was dead when Ralphie had died. Because that's about the same time that I stopped going to California. Because on that day. Did you answer my question? What? <laughs> I, oh, I'm gonna tell you now. We, 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 I'm gonna tell you, you now. You didn't go with your own band. You said you no. With Ralphie's band. I went there first with my own band with Barreto. We played um, the big place there where you're talking about the Palladium, right? You had your own band. Yeah, that time. Okay. That time. I was going there before Ralphie. Then Ralphie started going out, and I went out there to promote my records. That's how I started. So then, while I was out there, Ralphie started going on his own. And he had a little band, I have to make it with you, right? So right. he says, look, I'll get a band. So then he started calling me. He found out I was just as popular as Ralphie was out in California. We both were. Nobody else was doing the circuit. He said, Joe, come on out. Let's do a show together. OK. He says, I got a little band out here. You know, play anything. I said, who the hell is this band? They were called the Midnighters. The right? Midnighters. The Midnighters. But they, 
they're not the same guys that I see now when I go out there, right? These guys didn't speak too much English, and they were all shorter than me. And then you got to be short if you're shorter than me. And they played any of our songs. So Robbie said, you don't have to do nothing. I just tell them what songs you play. Do I wish you love? Do this. And they'll play it. So I got on the plane. I put on my song. I take that, uh, that midnight flight, the red eye, and I would get there. He said, you can stay with me. We always never had a problem with anywhere to stay. Anybody would open up their house for Robbie Bogana, Joe Batani. Stay in my house. Stay in my house. That's what we did. And then when I got there, we would do the shows. He would go on. He, he, he had the girls sew his clothes that he would make up for himself. I was regular, regular with suit and shoes. And we would do the show. We'd make our money. I'd get back on the plane and come home. Right? And, and we did that for a while. And then one day he calls me. I'm in Atlantic City. And that's when I was starting to get hot internationally with Rapo Clapo. And he says, Joe, he says, I'm going to Columbia. I met this guy, this lawyer, and uh, I want to get some work out there. And I want you to come with me. So I never got the story because Robbie, I mean, Harvey tried to get it. And I, I had a, a theory what might have happened, even though people have told me what happened. And he said, come with me. I'm going down. So he goes. I said, no, I can't go, Robbie. I'm doing something. And he comes back. He said, ah, the guy wasn't there, you know, but I'm going back again. I said, well, look, I'm doing well out here. I'm going to Amsterdam. Uh, my record is starting to pop off, you know, and uh, I think things are going to happen. So he, he goes back the next time, and that's when he got killed. You know, my theory is that Joe Batan was popular in Colombia without us ever knowing, right? The riot was a national hit in, in Colombia. They called it, they changed the name to an avion. That's why I probably never knew. And they might have called for me, and Ralphie got my call and took the job. I don't know. But whatever it was, he went down there. And people say that it was in, in, in place of me. I don't know if that's true. Right? All I know is that he wanted me to go with him. Right? And uh, unfortunately, that's what happened. When I went to play in Columbia, finally, they had showed me pictures. You know, and uh, fortunately, um, they said it was over money. You know, because you couldn't go to that country wearing jewelry and stuff He like got that. shot or something, or he got killed? He got killed. You know, he, he, he got, got murdered. murdered. You know, he was murdered. He was murdered out there. I don't know if he got shot. And like he says, we don't know. So yeah. To this day, we don't know. How, how old was he? Oh, he how old? When he died? He was young. How old? He could have been in what the late 20s. What year are we talking about? You know, I'm bad on memory. I don't want to give a date and we'll get wrong about it. We'll give a rep. No. It's in the 70s. Early 70s? Mid-70s? Mid yeah, it could have been 78, 89. Oh, Matter of fact, it had to be 78. Around there, 79, because you know, that's when I was in Atlantic City, and he had called me. See, yeah, see, about 78. See, yeah. Pardon me for making you think. Yeah, no, you made me think. I put it together, you know. Yeah, that's all right. You know? Yeah. But no, Ralphie's like my brother. To this day, he's just as popular. And I found out the same thing was happening to me when I disappeared. After that, I stopped going to California. But never knowing that I was being bootlegged, I was being played everywhere, and I was part of the the, the Rasa community. You see, because the difference was when I tried to get an explanation from the Chicanos and the Mexican population, they said, Joe, we support our artists. So we pass our music down to the next generation. And that's what happened with Joe Batan. When I go there, you might find my fans might be six years old or 90. It's, it's amazing, you know? And, and, and it's really sincere. Oh, yeah. What, what, was, the last, what was the last time you saw Joe Batan? Me? Yeah. I've seen him a hundred times. When was times. the last time you saw him perform? When was the last time? Um, Were you at Lincoln Center or no? I was at Lincoln yeah. Center. Oh, yeah. I was at okay. Lincoln yeah. Center. Yeah. And, and, oh, yeah. Uh, okay. that's I mean, okay. Obviously, I've seen him perform yeah. plenty of times. You had to pay some of his soul I know that. that. I know that. In Brooklyn, the Polish, Polish place. Uh, I saw, yeah, in Brooklyn at that tiny little place. Right. Right, the photo center, something that they yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was, yeah, that was uh, that was, that was it was looked like someone's backyard. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Right, but it was great. Oh, it was the crowd was terrific. Oh, yeah, oh, man. That Bobby's. I don't know. Who was, was there? I was with the Titan Up guy. What's his name? Archie Bell. The Archie Bell was with us that night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he was there. He took pictures. He sang up there with us. Yeah, we. I have a, I have a video <laughs> of all of us singing uh, when we Do get I, married. That's what I when we, the Dream Lovers song. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, the place I'm talking about was the one in Williamsburg. 
Oh, you're talking about little, Union Pool, the little place. I play there every year. Place. I'll be there. there. Yeah. I'll be there. I'll be there June what, 7th. What do you mean? I'll be there. I'll be there every year. That's right. I, don't miss, <laughs> you know, I, don't miss, I love that place. That was yeah. cool, man, because it was a mm. real intimate thing. It was outdoors. No, that's the mm. show. That's the real show. Yeah, right. Exactly. By the way, May 18th, you can come see Joe Batan for free at the Museo del Barrio. That's 1 East 104th Street in Harlem. From three to five o'clock, we'll be playing a free concert. Inside or out. To the it's, inside or it's inside. It's done by Carnegie Hall. They're sponsoring it for uh, Museo de Barrio. We got buses coming from Philadelphia and Jersey, and uh, trying to get there early, May 18th, at Museo de Barrio. How many, is it a big place? Or yeah, it holds about 600, 700 people. They have a, they refurbish the theater inside the museum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you ever think, way back then? that your music you would still be doing this today no of course you have a dream at this level no not not really i mean you think you like to think that you make an impression i never knew my music would last this long that's what that gives, brings a that's, tear to my yeah. eye right you know especially being uh acknowledged by the smithsonian that's right. got to be the highlight of my life right yeah you know and then to have my portrait putting up there uh you have to think where the kid like me and the environment that I came in after being incarcerated and seeing my whole dream fulfilled and then being recognized there. Matter of fact, they're going to honor me again at the end of the year at the Smithsonian or, or again. Wow. Yeah, so that's, that's incredible. A double honor, yeah. It's absolutely incredible. So, uh, Gypsy Woman, Subway Joe, Riot. Poor Boy, Singing Some Soul, Mr. New York and the East Side Kids, Sweet Soul, um, St. Latin's Day Massacre. Then there was one that was unreleased, live from San Fantasia. Oh, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Right? I've mm -hmm. never seen that. Either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, I got to tell you the story quickly. I was with Ken Carey for South Soul Records, because, you know, I started South Soul Records. That's my name, uh, that history be corrected. They keep saying that they started. They did so. I started. You came up with the name yeah, Sal Soul. That's my name. My first album with them was called Sal Soul. What right. year was that? Oh, 1970, right after I left Fania. 73. Yeah. Because after I left Fania and he gave me my release after squabbling for two, three years, I said, What the hell am I going to do? That's all I ever knew was Fania. So I saw the magazine where these guys were doing cutouts, you know, and they, they were. No, they were doing kind of doing licensing. They had a hell of a business. Yeah, and then Ken RCA, Kelly, all the big companies. But well, he got that later. One, yeah. One, one, oh yeah, more mm -hmm. bringing in the Latin music. Mm -hmm. Columbia didn't have a Latin department. Right. So they yeah. had Julio Iglesias and all of these right. great artists from abroad. They, yeah. they weren't. They were, He's they a lucky guy, in. Joe Carey. He did that. He walked in there and said, "I want to distribute stuff," and they gave him a deal. He gave him two hundred fifty thousand. Smart guys. Very yeah. smart. Yeah, he said, I, I remind them of him when I walked out, you know, when I said, look, uh, I want to get paid. And finally, he had to pay me. Finally, I started getting paid when I was with them. But the fact remains that when I started that label, uh, it was a brand new thing. I was bringing them into a different world, Completely. right? They knew nothing about music. They would, his father made his money in pantyhose or selling stuff to the mafia back in the days. And uh, he said, well, what do you want to do? Why are you leaving Fania? I said, look, I didn't get along. I didn't get paid. I was doing this. He says, well, what can we do? We don't know nothing. You got to help us. No problem. Just give me enough money here to do this album, and we can do it. So they gave me token money, and I did the album. So, and it came out on Americana? Yeah. And that which funny is part thing of, was, was part of Sal Soul? Yeah. No, or no. It wasn't, wasn't even Sal Soul. No, Soul yet. it wasn't Sal Soul. Was so we got the album out. What do we do? I said, well, I got to try to get it played. So I had never really done it. I went out on promotion to myself. And the first company I wanted was w, uh, WBLS, right? Frankie was there. And I walked in. And now, you got to understand, artists do not go to the record stations. They don't want the artists to come up there. You send your promotion guy. But I went anyway. I knew a lot of the guys, you know? And they looked at me and they said, so I sat there. And he was on the doing this jacket, you know? And I'll never forget the day. I said, shit, this is my life. I would try anything, just like Harvey, right? I said, I, I don't give a damn. I'm walking up there. So I got the interview. I got up there, and he says, okay, what do you can do for you? He wouldn't look at me. He just kept playing his records. 
I said, well, Frankie, I got a new album here. I wanted to know where I got to play. He looked and said, yeah, who's the distributor? So at that time, I didn't understand that. <coughs> but what he was noting about was, what the hell, I would play a record if you can't sell it, right? So that's why he asked for the distributor, but I didn't understand the jargon at that time. I said, well, you know, there's some songs here, and I was hoping that you could play something. I said, okay, leave it there. Yeah. I said, okay, thank you. So I walked out, well, you know, with my, my head between my legs. So what the hell happened there, man? The guy didn't even talk to me. You know, shit. I got in the elevator. The kid was waiting down there holding my car so I wouldn't get a ticket. And I got in the damn car, turned the radio on, and here's Joe Batamp. I said, get the hell out of here. Not only did he start playing the record, this is no payola. All right? Nothing like that. He just played the record, and he asked me before I gave it to him, who else is playing this? Because that was very important right. to Frankie. He, was the first one. he didn't That's want right. nobody else playing right. it. Right. He played the record, and then when I drove about two blocks, he played the next one. I said, holy shit. Wait. Then he played the next one. And the thing was, he gave it to uh, my friend Webb, who did Morning Drive on the station, and they would play my Ken's, album. Ken's, Ken, 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 Ken Spider Ken's, Web. Ken Spider Web. Kenny would play the record every morning, three or four cuts on, on morning time. And that's how it brought Joe Batan back on the map. After Fania had stopped playing my records for so long, right. Joe Batan was back on the scene. So what did he play from the album? Do you remember? Oh, man, he played Muchacho Ordinario. Sonny Muchacho cool. Ordinario yeah. is Ordinary Guy yeah, right. in <laughs> Spanish. Right. 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 And you also did Mi Nube. And I did Latin Strut. Latin Strut. Which was the Adonis record, Super so, Strut. Super Strut. Right. And you did Mi Nube, which was My Cloud. Right, exactly. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, that version of my, I love that version. Mi Nube, that, right. that smokes, man. Thank that's, you. That's, that's great. It's so really that great. That was like the start. When I went back to the South Soul, they said, wow. They sold 15,000 records the first week. That was unheard of for them. Yeah. They said, what else can we do? I said, well, you know, I like to do an album. He said, yeah, let's do the next one. You know? I said, so he gave it to me. I said, no. Nah. He said, what do you mean, no? Nah? I said, you got to pay me now. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, look, thank you. My family thanks you. <laughs> I, and I said, from the bottom of my heart, you put Joe Batan back on the mat. Thank you so much. See you. And I started to walk out the door. He says, come here, you little. He said, you remind me of me. He said, sit down. What do you want? I said, okay, well, I'm getting paid. I want money now. And we made a deal. And that's how I I said, I want my own record company. And it's going to be called South Soul. And such and such and such. And he gave me everything that I wanted. And then he didn't know that history was going to be made there. Right. Because after I did the bottle, we saw 80,000 records the first week. Wow. And I didn't use radio. I did record pools before record pools were being done. Right. I discovered... I used to hang out in the sanctuary, the garage, all the, the zoo, all these places that Latin bands and Latin promoters didn't know anything about. They didn't frequent these clubs. They only knew Latin clubs. But I was here in all these underground clubs where you couldn't even get in if you didn't look the part. And I would make friends with the DJs, and they would play my records. I think one of the first records I busted there was my rendition of Shaft, right? And uh, uh, at, at the, the sanctuary, right. So then what happened was I went to the garage and Larry Levant was there. Wow. I didn't know who the hell he was. I said, this guy jumping over the crazy kid, you know? And he says, I said, look, I got a record over here. And he played the first few bars. Give me that record for tonight. I said, what do you mean? Who are you? Son, I just want to play in my club. I said, all right, yeah. The next thing I know, he says, come down to my club. And, 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 and sing or do this record. We sold 20,000 20, records. BLS was one of the hottest records on the radio because not only was it the hottest record, Gil Scott had one out, those girls put out the bottle, and then I put, that was three succession that Ranky would play all three at the same time, and I still sold records. And of course, then we made the deal with RCA. And then I was really on my way because now uh, I was coming out with the rap record. And the guy said, it's going to be a hit. I said, okay, let's see. So he says, I only could give you a dollar. right?" And he made a big mistake when he signed a contract with me. It was for domestic, right? So in the bottom of the contract, I wrote down, P.S., uh, 
any other negotiations for abroad would have to come through me. He didn't read it, right? And then the record started taking off. And then Holland called, hey, we want that record over there. That's going to be a big hit. So Glenn Russo worked there. He said, Joe, they want you in Holland. I said, what for? And the record just came out. He said, it's a hit. I said, how the hell could they know it's a hit? They didn't even play. He said, that's how it goes in Europe. They know. I said, but that's a small country. He says, that's how the record starts. They go and everybody picks it up. I said, yeah, bullshit. You know, I didn't have a penny to my pocket, right? And you went on a TV show. Yeah, so what happened was uh, I had nothing to wear. I had 15 cents in my pocket. So I borrowed $10, went downtown, and I bought a dollar pair of suspenders, uh, colorful. I got a star for 50 cents, and I put it on, and I made a disco shirt for 250 And I wore it in, and that was my uniform. When I got to Harlem, they said, you're going to go on the biggest TV show in the country. There was only three TV stations in Holland. It was called Music Latin. And when I got there, I forgot my shoes. I said, holy shit, I'm here on the TV and I ain't got no damn shoes. So I had to go on there with the track shoes. And they were for, for a lesson yellow. And I was wondering became, how you got that. That became the hit yeah. of Europe. Everybody started copying my style and it was an accident. And the next thing I know, Rapper Clapper went to number one. And then Sugar Hill followed me. But actually, Joe Batan was the first rap record in all of Europe. Sugar Hill came and we battled. When it's they amazing came over, how this will happen, man. Oh, yeah. Just, the rest, I was international. Right. Fanny could have never done that. Charles Hall could have never done it if they didn't make the deal with RCA. Right. Because RCA flew me around the world first class everywhere I went, you know? And I said, well, when am I going to get paid? Right. They said, you'll see, you'll see. I said, I don't understand this shit. Why am I traveling all these places? I went to Europe for one day, and I ended up staying six months and never got back to New York. That's how big the record was. When, really? I, got, when I got back, I was able to take advances of 10000 from BMI. That's unheard of. They don't do that no more, right? And, of course, I made a, a, a big, good penny from there. But, of course, you know, I had bad habits at that time. You know, I was, yeah. I was a fierce gambler, you know, and a lot of that money went in Vegas and around the world and all the racetracks and stuff like that. But uh, nevertheless, that was the start of, of big things with, with South Soul Records. And you you created the name Sal Soul. Oh, right? yeah, without a doubt. He said, what does it mean? I said, Sal means salsa, soul means soul. So it's the combination. Instead of saying Latin soul, which everybody had done already, I said, let me call it something else, Sal Soul. And, mm. th and then you, for some reason, you got out of the label? Yeah, well, I had problems. Joe Patan was always obstinate, you know, and of course with the record companies, uh, I had some bad habits of my own, but nevertheless, you know, when you get into this business, you think things will never end. Right. That everything's going to last. So I could always do it forever. I could do it again. I could do it again. Of course, that was working for me for a certain amount of time, you know, but, uh, you know, it starts to cease happening later on when you get older because you got a family. You can't do the things that when you're reckless and wild when you're young. Right. You know, I'm sure Harvey could tell you about that. That's why he said you, you don't know why you got married. But <laughs> I'm okay with being married, don't get me wrong. But uh, a lot of times when you got responsibility. Got Is Yvonne yeah. watching this? I don't know. She might be in church. <laughs> she might be in church. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, Sal Sol, and then that label exploded. Oh, they went to Dance Label of the World. Yeah, right. Dance Label of the World. Philadelphia, the whole They just uh, sold it to uh, what, BMG. So BMG handles it now, you know. But I was able to get 10 of my songs back from them with my attorney. So that that that's a, that was a good sign. Now I'm working on Fania. You know, so you never know. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. So, Harvey, when did, when did your um, your first LP was... Viva Soul. Viva Soul? Yeah. And then what about like the Harvey Vern Dozen? That was, that was uh, Harvey Vern Dozen. My Dream? That was the first song I ever wrote. From Viva Soul. Was that from yeah, Viva yeah, Soul? Yeah. Remember I told you that it was probably the coolest line ever written? Cool part of two lines, yeah. Right? Exactly. To work when I can groove as a drag? That's what I made. That, this is, that right says everything. There. It was the truth. I wrote it in the back of my car. And I was being driven to work. I was hating that job. See? If you're talking about money, I was making big money, okay? I had 23 salesmen. Uh, I was doing music weekends, you know, and and, uh, 
and I, and, I would, I'm, and and I had my own chauffeur. I had my own limo. I, 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 the Fleetwood Brom was the biggest Cadillac that they made. That was at a stretch, you know. And uh, and I just couldn't go to work. I couldn't get out of bed. I couldn't go to work. I was hating it. I, salesmen were driving me crazy. And uh, and um, and and the sushi made me this offer. I said, well, "Boom!" When I met him, how much? I want you know to run the company. How much does it pay? He said three hundred a week. I said I pay my show for three hundred a week. Okay? <laughs> so you know he said to me, "I hope you didn't forget how to drive." <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, and uh, and so 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 for, for, for me it never was just the money. I want I wanted to love what I was doing, right? And 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 then I, and and make money at it. But I never. I, in the end, I just could not do things for just money. I just couldn't do it. I walked away from big, I walked away from a couple of hundred big ones. Okay, not a half of it in green. Okay, it took in 1963. I'm just saying, 1960s. You know what kind of money that is? That was millions of dollars. Millions of dollars. Of course, nothing to be played with. I, I, I was in a group. We, I traded that Fleetwood, I, I leased the Fleetwood Road. Uh, change it every year, including insurance. Two hundred a month. Could you believe it? Including insurance. That's when caddies were big. Okay. Caddies yeah, aren't that yeah, big yeah. anymore. Back well, in the fifties and sixties, caddies were the hog. I needed, yeah, hard. Hard. I, right? needed <laughs> I needed something to give me the limo field that wasn't a limo. So they had the desk that came out of the back seat. You know, and uh, I still had to Puerto Rico every weekend. I mean, it was you know, of course, nothing. So, so some of your records uh, have come back to be like uh, staples of Northern Soul. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I Never Learned to Dance. Never Learned to Dance is now selling for $2,400 on eBay. Okay? And I um, myself, when I moved to Florida, the joke was this. I moved to Florida in 04, right? To Daytona. I stayed there about three years, four years. So, so you can't take everything with you. I didn't do nothing with the 45s. I haven't played 45 in 100 years. I had two boxes and never looked at the answer. I threw them out. <clears throat> I threw them out. Do you, you want, it's Joe, your song, right? Yo, two little boxes. <clears throat> okay? And I'm I'm carrying, I'm moving big stuff that ain't worth nothing down of Florida. Okay? It's just I didn't know about this 45 business. Yeah. So like that's a Florida. Yeah. And eBay and the collectors and this and that. Right. Yeah. Big I mean, over in England. When, listen, when I got to Florida, my friend who was the CEO of uh, the lodging hotel association in, in Volusia County, which includes Daytona Beach, childhood friend, Jewish guy, Bob Davis. He was a, he used to be a mambo neck. He loved he was a mambo teacher. He ran hotels in the castle, and he he just built himself up in hotel business. That's what they call the the uh, the people at the Palladium, right? Mambo, Mambo Nicks. Mambo Nicks. Mambo Nicks. Yeah. So so um, so anyway, he's married, and and uh, and I have a I have a at that time I had a, 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 a I moved into my house with a friend. It was a, my friends. I, I had a, an Ames Classic chair, you know, the one with the wood like that goes like that in the back, one piece, and it was in back. But it, it's in a museum of modern art. It's worth about six thousand dollars, and I was broke. I needed money. His wife said, "You know what? I'm I started to play with eBay. Let me let me see what I can do on that." Yes, so she took pictures, and uh, she said, "Harvey, listen, there's a lot of them that are, that are being sold for twenty five hundred. You know, you want to put it for six thousand? I said, "Take it." So she said, "We'll sell it in one day. We'll do what they call a uh, buy now. No, no bidding. Right. No bidding. Right. Yeah. Buy it now. Yeah, yeah. So she got right. twenty five hundred." She got you and, 2500 yeah, Then she said, then Boy, she did you me, walk out, man? Joe, 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 <laughs> it's not worth that much now. Yes, it is. Joe, <laughs> Joe, no. Joe listen to this. Joe, listen to this. I'll told show me, you. Then she told Joey. She, then she told me, this, listen, Harvey, I keep seeing your name on eBay. What's this thing about um, uh, Camel Walk? You produce Camel Walk. And uh, she says, you had that? And and so I, she said, oh, keep what you you got any forty fives you don't want? So I gave her seven, eight, nine forty five, still different ones. Mm. Okay? And uh and then she calls me up about three days later, Joe, and she says, uh, you got any more that I've learned to dance? 
I said, why? She said, because you gave me two of them. I sold them for $550 each. Right. In 04. Well, Joe, 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 I threw away 25 in a box, 50 of them. Wow. Joe. And DJ copies are worth more than commercial copies. Oh, so yeah. That's it. Because they didn't make as many. Yeah, yeah. Do you still have the master tapes? No, you don't it's have them. It's a funny record. It's a funny record? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, according, this is my Bible right here. What is that? Okay. This, is John, this is John Manship's um, record guide to Northern Soul Records and stuff. Oh, wow. Really? Feel this thing, man. Oh! How often does it come Bible. out? How often does it come out? Feel that. Oh my God! Right, my this God. is this is. I'm going to show yeah, everybody right this. This is the latest edition. My buddy John Manship. Uh, this is the the um, latest edition. Manship's USA seventh edition price guide to all uh, soul music and northern soul. Okay. And you know yeah. because I sell records for a living, so I had I have to keep up with the latest book because the do. prices change all the time. Well, when do you yeah. sell them? Yeah, you know, uh, online on Discogs. Okay, you, know, you, know, you don't Discord. do eBay or that No, I don't like eBay. Okay. I don't do it. It's a pain in the oh. ass. Okay. You know, but um, years ago, because I, I had a big collection, and years ago, I had, I had this guy, John Manship, who's my buddy. Are you listening, John? <laughs> I told him about this was going to be on today. But, put, your face, uh, put your face on the screen. Yeah, yeah. they know what I look okay. like. <laughs> you know, um, um, John came to my house. Yeah, he's the biggest in the world, man. Wow, yeah, he, I, know, he, yeah, I mean, man. this guy's got it going on, bro. I'm telling you, every every when every Tuesday night he puts out an auction, and then he, you get an email if you're subscribed to his. He's email not the list. one that runs over there in uh, Hollywood Inn at Forty Second. No, okay, no, that's those right. small potatoes. Oh, over there, small potatoes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Anyway, he has these customers. I don't know where he gets these customers, man. But oh, nice. he has he has records every week. That sell for thousands and thousands of dollars. Wow. He has these obviously well-to-do English. The stuff. Uh, yeah, like that. No, no, Northern Soul. Northern Soul, man. Yeah. yeah, stones yeah. aren't worth anything. Yeah. Well, you know, but cannonball. You know, all those guys. yeah, you know, so but, but, but so, he's, so what, what, he's got it going on, man. Let me tell you. I mean, he sells records, like I said, for thousands every week. Every week. What a life. I, when I speak to him, I say, I want to be you when I grow up. And I ask him if he wants to adopt me. Wow. You know, he's a, he's the greatest life. He just goes, travels the world, <laughs> buying records, selling them. You know, Harvey Averne doesn't. All right. Uh, the LP, Harvey Averne doesn't, uh, including Never Learn to Dance. Hi, Alfie. Th uh, Fanya 367. For the LP. Yeah. It's worth... Uh, it's worth uh, Three hundred dollars. Okay, and 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 uh, and um. But what condition? Uh, what, what about, oh, that's in mint condition. Oh, okay. that's in mint condition. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But, but, Never but, learned to dance. Talking about the forty-five. Yeah, backed with the song Dynamite. Right. On uptight. Right. That was where I was. That was yeah. that label. That, that was the Fania. Yeah. Soul label. The Fania subsidiary. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. on uptight, uh, goes for about eight hundred bucks. Okay. According to John. Okay. Eight hundred dollars. That's current. That's current. Okay. That's current, which is still pretty damn good. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? And then you got uh, what's another one here? Make out. That's the first record I record. Make out back with the think drink spiked. Yeah. Is uh, worth about one hundred and fifty bucks. Look at that. The forty-five, and then it lists make out uh, Viva Soul albums worth about seventy-five bucks. Right. That's the other thing landed. Uh, yeah. My dream. Oh, that's no, that's not worth any money, really. But then you got um, Central Park, which I liked. That was good. Yeah. Central Park was good. When you did, I never learned. Alfie, what are you doing? When you did, uh, when you wrote, I never learned to dance. Where you? Because I, when I, I never learned to, to dance. When I, yeah, 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 I know. But when I hear that, I hear Tighten Up in there. Yeah, I, Tighten Up was a little, little. Yeah, Were you influ right influenced, influenced by that? Right on, yeah. Because that that yes. that little riff tightened up, man. Yeah, it, was, it influenced a lot of people. Yeah, right? definitely. I'm, you know, I'm you listen to Willie really and the Mighty Magnus. That's what uh, George Gola did with Tito Ramos. Archie Bell, I'm guilty. What? Oh, the meditation. meditation. Tighten up. Yeah, tighten up. Yeah, tighten up. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's what it was. Yeah. Drum call. Yeah. Right. It's tighten up. Yeah, that really influenced a lot of people. Yeah. To tighten up. Had a great groove. 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then you did Accept Me? And he didn't even know he had a hit record. He was going to the Army, he told me. Who's this? Uh, the guy that did the Tighten Up, Archie Bell. Bell. He said, because he got a big farm in Texas, and he said, no, when that record happened, I was getting drafted. <laughs> he he didn't even he know. Said, no. Yeah. That's why he came in uniform, and he sang with me for Ralph Mercado for one of his show and shows. I remember. Me. So uh, how did, how did um, Ghetto Records come about? Show me. You can see what it says about Ghetto. What? It got nothing about Ghetto in here? Well, it goes by artist. Oh, really? Yeah, it goes by artist. go by the label? No. 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 Who's, who, I had just sold did, it. Did you start Ghetto Records? Yeah. You didn't sing for Ghetto. No, I couldn't. I was on the contract. And how'd you but come I up with that? I did make one recording. How, on, name, on Ghetto? Good name, good name, good name. I kept it quiet. I got the tracks. Good name, good logo. Good music. Good out. You got pull I just these? made a deal. Oh, you did? I, I wanna, just sold I, it to Florida. I, Half, and I'm a half partner. I, I Coco bought one of uh, Ghetto's records, Polo T's. He couldn't. Couldn't be buy that without me. You know, I, I refused to sell it. Second album I put out. If he signed it, you know he was a crook anyway. Started to say the evidence. He well, somebody had the master, Joe. I got the master. No, but he didn't have Chilpy, him having the master. He didn't have no master. He didn't have the master. He kept trying to borrow it from me. He might have copied it from the record, but the masters I just sold. So did you come up with that logo, the yeah. cat in the garbage can? Izzy did that, but it's my name. I love that. Oh, Ghetto Records That's, was my name. That was a good name. It was a good logo. Yes, yeah, yeah, I love that logo, that. man. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, uh, I, uh, I, had a, I had a record on Ghetto. Um, Joe Acosta. Yeah, yeah, my love. Something about love. Um, uh, I Need You. Yeah, I Need You. Right, I Need right, You, right. Joe Acosta. All those, all those, like, minor guys back in the day. You know, uh, there were so many of those guys that were really good. Um, um, stop, Alfie. Benitez and uh, Nabula. He, he just died. He just died? Yeah. Yeah, Benitez. Stop it, Alfie. Um, yeah, he was on fire. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the TNT band. Yeah. And um, uh, 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 what's his name? Uh, the guy who did Tender Love. Oh, Paul Ortiz. Paul Ortiz. Yeah. Orchestra. Records. Orchestra song. Yeah. That was on Ghetto yeah, Records. Records. Yeah, I produced that. You, I produced that. I really? wound up owning it. I don't know how. You wound up owning Ghetto? Yeah, promoted the shit out of it. We sold it okay, not great. See, what they did was, here to tell you the true story. I was falling out with this guy. He was a gangster. How come and he turned come steady? I said, what's up with I this? I did. I told you, fuck you, Harvey. You ain't going to get this. But you, know, you got a short memory. <laughs> and, and me, I know what I was doing. Because when I made the deal with this guy, he was a drug dealer. All right, he put the money in back of the company. It's all my ideas. So I produced the shit. Then he started getting ideas, people coming to him. Oh, uh, I, I want to do this and I want to do this. What the fuck are you talking about? We're supposed to be partners. Yeah, but you know, so he got greedy like a lot of them, right? I said, look, fuck you, go ahead, do it yourself. So he, the rest of the albums, they were shit. Right. All right, after Paul and Tiz, it was shit, right? So he said, oh, I'm selling the company, but I didn't know at that time that he got arrested, right, by the feds. So he turned state evidence and he was setting me up to go down. So he gave me the books, everything, and said, here's the office, same building, find it, 888 Avenue, I had the office. He says, take it. The phones were tapped, everything, right? Wow. I never told this story. And uh, he says, oh, the guys want to buy the label. So I told him, it's Harvey Bird. I said, I'm selling shit. He said, yeah, but you got the masters. Said, yeah, I stayed with the masters, right? Because Broadway Sound had our tapes. Harvey went over there to try to buy the tapes from them. They were going out of business. So the woman ended up throwing the shit in the streets, right? A lot of the tapes, finally, everybody's shit in the streets. I didn't buy no tape from no studio. Okay, but I'm just trying to tell you. I don't do that. But who you got it from? If I got it, I got bought it from someone that represented that day only. Yeah. Well, they did not. I told them he signed the contract, and it was on every radio. I didn't try to. I, yeah, they did that shit. They couldn't do it because I my, owned it. it. My, you know, my first it's album. My first album was was uh, uh, two albums I bought from Ralph Lowe to just get the pipeline set that I didn't produce. But it's let that. Tell me if you did it, Jerry, uh, Jerry Masuji. Did you put your name on the ghetto records at all? 
The release, when you released it? I have no idea. I don't remember. You, you remember everything else? But you don't remember. <laughs> remember. All right. All right. Listen, if I bought uh, it, it says Coco. And I'm telling you I that it, I didn't sell that shit. If I bought it, it says Coco. Okay? Uh, then, now, 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 if if they if they wanted the the, the, the produced by Ghetto or they allowed me to do it, I seem to see that label, that logo in my mind that Steve mentioned. So maybe it's oh, I know I, I remember when they wanted to get it because you sent somebody there to get the tapes and I said no because I was filing out with this guy. This fucking guy set me up, right? And I was gonna fuck him because he thought he was getting slick uh, after I did all the producing and everything, made the name. He was gonna take credit and sell this shit behind my back. He couldn't do it without me. It was a, it, the whole corporation was built on Joe Batan and George Feeble. So if anything else was done, that it was illegal. Maybe I recorded. Maybe I recorded the full of Maybe you did. Maybe you did. Maybe you did. Who else? Because you, I just sold the label. So you would know by the floor. You would know by the. The whole catalog is coming out, right? And, and I'm a partner. That's it. I, you I would know. You would know by the songs. That, that I put out at that album. I mean, I don't really know the other part of the no, I never, I never heard that on, no, no, that no album but if I out. told you the names, you'd say, no, that's fine, or the, the, okay, the new ones, you would know. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know, yeah. yeah. I didn't even know. Listen, I bought- Look, you guys mad at me too, Paul Ortiz. They all mad at me, but a good fucking guy. I bought- Is listen, he still guy, alive? He had to leave the country. They probably gave him, uh, what do you call that, when they relocate you? He fought. He, 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 you got a lot of people locked up, they're to kill his ass. Oh, really? The fucking guy, we, we used to do bad shit, right? But he was the one that put the money up, you know? So I said, okay, you're going to put the money up? You don't know. Was Madeira, was Madeira, Jose Madeira involved in, in, in the He did some there. arrangements. He did the arrangements I'll tell you what, for I, that band. That's all he did. You, the artist came to me, my Jose Madeira was who's. You know, we had dinner, dinner with him the yeah, other night. Yeah, they probably I mean, did. I mean, was, every time I see him, he says, "Where's my money?" Is it, is, it was <laughs> it was uh, it was represented to me as as clean deal. I don't. I I I'm not sure what. Which doesn't was. hold up in a court of law. Right. No. It's okay. Right? It's, okay. Yeah. it's okay. I watch Judge Judy all the time. Okay. No. 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 Listen. <laughs> listen. It doesn't hold up in a court of law. But if he if Joe owned it, yeah, I wouldn't buy from somebody else right. behind his back. That's the court. Well, at that time, That's everybody would tell you anything. That's the court yeah. of the street. That's I did a thing with Bobby Marin called Mr. Love and Company. If I were a king, right? Big hit. Yeah. Jerry found out. He threatened him, and he's like a punk. He gave it to Jerry. That was like I wouldn't have gave shit to Jerry. Was that on Uptight? No, we made our own label. I forgot what the blue label. Yeah, I, I had that record. Yeah, that's like your rarest record. It says Very Mr. Hard. Love and yes. Company. I didn't put my name. Very hard to get that yeah. record, man. Um, that you know, where I got that idea from Stevie Wonder when he recorded his one record and he spelled his name backwards. I have a dread now, <laughs> yeah. See, you know, all right. yeah. He played, he played Paul Swall uh, instrumental harmonica. Yeah, that's he, where I got the idea from. Prince did it too. I don't know what he did, yeah. That's a great album. Now, Stevie was a hell of a harmonica player. Man. I would tell you the story when I was in the room with him. No, oh man, we went to California, we had to do something. They got this girl. Teach Joe Batan how to dance and dress, you know, Hollywood style. So the girl's taking me around. She knows everybody. Yeah, come on. And I say, oh, I was against it. I said, you gotta tell me how to dress. And I like, but they were right because I didn't really have the showmanship that I that I do now. And she took me around, and then she says, we're gonna go to a party. I said, yeah, where? Well, he says, well, Stevie's having I said, Stevie who? Stevie Wonder. I said, Stevie Wonder. I kid you not. The room was no bigger than this. He had an organ piano that he plays that makes all kinds of sound. He had two other guys, nobody else. And the music that emulated out of that room was music like I never heard in my life. The place was on fire. She brought me in that room and said, go up there and introduce yourself. I said, what? I want to tell you, you don't know me. She says, you'll be surprised. He knows everything. Just tell him you're the Latin guy. I said, Get out of here. The Latin guy? guy? He's the Latin guy. He says, he, he knows. I said, he says, you see why he's moving his head like that? I said, yeah, why? He said, because he hears everything in the room. Now go pick up that cowbell and sit next to him. I <laughs> felt like a jerk, man. I had the guy from Freddie Prince uh, that was supposed to get the part, Isaac Rios, with me. He never forgets because they had over there, uh, what's the guy, Sanford and Son. He was sitting right there. Another guy was there. Red All Fox? these celebrities. Yeah, Red Fox was sitting there. 
I didn't realize all these people were in there. So I go up to Stevie one day and I whistle. I'm the Latin guy. I say, ah, it's, an it's so funny because I don't know. He, he really knew who the hell I was. And I sat there and picked up the combo, but I didn't do nothing. His music spoke for itself. That guy, when he played, I have never seen a musician capture a room like that. I never right. heard music like that in my life. He don't, you know? he don't even need two guys with him. Yeah, that's he's what I mean. Oh, I'm telling you, what an genius. experience. He, yeah. did, he, did, he did something for Bonnie, didn't he? I think he said well, something at a, at a concert or something. Yeah. Stevie Winwood did it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So so this this book here has um Stevie Winwood, Joey, he got a he got such a good I you know, uh I make me a higher life. Mm -hmm. Joe, Joe, on one show that I watched on TV this week, I think it was called The Village. Mm -hmm. Joe, Joe had played the song the whole fucking show. Wow. And the royalty on that show, we gotta be cool, my God. Wow. Stevie Winwood. Show. Just, no, no, somebody else sang it. It wasn't CV's recording. Yeah. But it was the song, the, yeah. whole, the whole show. I swear to God. I, I can't even think about how the royalty. See, there's Good some time. stuff here that John doesn't even know. Because he has, if I were a king, listed the flip side is Cry. Oh, that was my record, yeah. That I did. Uh... And it says Fania 611. And it's only worth like 40 bucks. Oh, so he missed. He missed that version on that label. I'm trying to think of a label that if uptight, I were... Uptight, uptight. No, 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 no. Not, not, not the one that I did. Finally, I came. Not oh, he put it out later on Fania, but not my version right. that was put out with yeah. Bobby Marin. Right. Bobby Marin could tell you. If Bobby Marin's listening, what label was that? <laughs> I thought it was uptight, no? No, no. He, he gave it up Yeah. to Jerry Masucci when Jerry Masucci threatened him. He said, that's my artist. You know, I said, you got Joe Batan singing on that record. You know, but um, we, we knew well, what's, Bobby, the question, what's the question to Bobby and Money? Uh, what's the label that we recorded that song together? You want to ask him up for John Paul? <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. He, he, look at this, folks. He, look at this. He's calling up Bobby Marine right now. That's the kind of <laughs> that's the kind of people I hang out with, man. Power, baby. Power. Bobby Marine did a great song uh, called There's No Other Girl, or he produced it, I mm -hmm. think. Do you so remember? Uh, no, uh, uh, who the hell is the who artist? Is he doing? Um, Oliveri. Okay, yeah, great song. Right, there's no Oliveri. other girl. I always that, that said gave that gave me some competition. I, yeah. al I always said I that Joe that. Batan should do that song. Man. Yeah, because that's right up your alley. That song. Oh man, yeah, I like that song. I love the way you walk. Yeah, very simple. Oh, that's but a it, killer, man. It gets to you. Oof. Do you know I sold, when I was at Downstairs Records, I had 20 copies of that 45. I wow. sold each one for 100 bucks. Wow. And that was back and in they, 1993. And they were asking me for that recently. Now it's worth like two, 300. Wow. And the album, the Oliveri album, the version of, uh, mm -hmm. was different. It's forwarded to an automated voice. The version was different of, uh, uh, there's no other girl. Right. The version on the album, he added an organ. Yeah, right. Get to my ear. Bobby, 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 how you doing? Bobby, I'm sitting here doing the TV thing. I listen to you. Joe Batan, I said, how come Joe wants to say something? That would be so perfect for you. Hey, Bobby, what was the name of that label that we did, If I Were a King, that you gave up to Jerry Masucci, punk? <laughs> <laughs> the name of the label, Bobby, you came up. Joe also wants to know the, your address because he wants to send the FBI. <laughs> to get you. I'm on, say hello to Sonia. And, uh, and uh, if, you, if, you, if you pick this up in a reasonable time, you call back. We're doing the show. Joe brought it up, Bye. <laughs> so, how about uh, let me throw a name? How about Landy Nova? Oh, I know Chino, that Chino Delgado. Tell me about him, Landy Nova. Landy Nova played in the neighborhood. He wasn't really like a big. No, he no. He became a promoter more than a. Musician, he, never, right? he, no, no. He, he, no? he was one of the younger kids that were younger than me, and he took lessons. Famous piano player, you know. And of course, we were all at the beginning. Of our musical career on the piano, everybody tried to outdo everybody. So every time he learned a new chord or something, he would come down and set to the good. show, and and I, I would listen to it and try to follow what he did. 
you know, and then lately I, I recorded first, but he kept his band together. And then just like uh, Toti Negron with Bobby Rodriguez, he worked at Fania. He got a shot and they recorded, you know, and he did this slow song that is an underground classic. I forget the name of it, but everybody in California asks for it. I called up Landy Nova, which he changed his name. His name was uh, Orlando Delgado. He's on Facebook. Actually. Yeah, yeah, he lives in Florida. Yeah. And uh, we talked, matter of fact, we talked last week. And what he did was, I asked him to come. They wanted to see him, because they had never seen him, you know. And he said he couldn't. And so, he, you know, he, that was another guy that couldn't make it. And so uh, the record is underground hit. He, he yeah. knows, you know. And every, Plenty of guys like that, Yeah, you know. Uh, Joe Quijano. Joe Quijano. Joe Quijano. He was pretty big. No. Yeah, Joe Quijano just passed. No, so Charles and Benny Yeah. Be yeah. So what, what about? Uh, I had. I How many like, totalo? What I about Cesta records? I, I, I have the joke. Mm -hmm. What about the shingling stuff? When did that all happen? That was Boogaloo. I mean, they got the yeah. beach. Yeah. They started doing that uh, with uh, Nando, who, right. who recorded for Angelo Santiago. And he played guitar. King Nando? King Nando, right. You know, before he passed. And of course, a lot of people were doing Boogaloo or finding out different names. And Shingling was yeah, just another right. name. Of, it was of a Boogaloo. dance. Yeah. So that's still happening. That's still happening. <clears throat> like, mm -hmm. like I, I did a couple of sides with uh, Joe work with them with the um, uh, Spanglish oh. Fly. They, yeah. they, they did it. One Spanglish? Side, Spanglish Fly. They yeah. Brooklyn Boogaloo, Brooklyn Boogaloo on one side. And the other side, my shape. Big announcement. Uh, Spanish Fly asked me to do a song with them, which I did about a year ago. And I just got a text that he says that uh, Spike Lee is using the song for his next film. Wow. So that's like the biggest thing in their life. So as Jonathan was saying, I, I think it's called New York Rules, right? But he said it's going to be in the movie. I'm excited for it. It's true, you know. So how, how does that work when they use a, uh, a song of yours in a movie? Well, it's different now. Yeah. Before you didn't pay, but now they, they're finding out that the radios and the TV, they have to pay residuals to the artists also. Right? So, so but the movie, know. here's how the movie goes. They use, cause they use a couple of our songs. If you, it's, it's usually a $10,000 hit on the recording side, the mm -hmm. master, and, and $10,000 on the publishing writer side. So the master side is record company and artists is supposed to split it down the middle, 5,000 each. That's the normal advance. Same thing with the publishing and the writing. The publishing has 5,000 on those deals and the writing gets <coughs> to split it, okay? Now, now, I've that's happened to me a few times, okay? With, 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 uh, with, with the, but, but the re royalty thing, that that in the end, you know, I never saw anything with royalties. I don't know what happens with that. I know about the hit. Yeah, I the got the same hit. thing. I got the same thing with your talking about. Did you yeah. get the royalties? Yeah. No, no royalties. I just got that ten thousand. We were supposed to get royalties. Yeah, right? on the Joe? street lamp they did on the movie. I forget, okay, uh, but Joe, we're supposed to get that, the royalties. That, that artist, uh, he's popular now. He played the basketball picture, common. Yeah, so he covered my record. Under the street lamp with a rap, right? And they put it in the movie. You got ten grand. I ain't gonna fight that. <laughs> like, like Big Daddy nice. Kane. Big Daddy Kane did one of my songs. Rose, I did Lullaby of Rose, Rosemary's Baby. So he recorded it for. I think it was his first. The bit when he left his small label called Chillin' and he went to uh, MCA or something. Mm -hmm. So finally, he called me up and I said. Uh, Come on down, I got it, we got it, and uh, they, you know, we split ten thousand five thousand eight. But but I never signed away royalties, but I never see royalties in my statements or in anything. I don't hear nothing about royalties, is what I'm trying to say. Mm. It's not that I signed it away. I didn't. So if I, in the, I said, to me, that was an advance. Yeah. Okay, that's how I thought. Right. 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 I mean, where you know, if a, if a film blows up and it's huge. Well, oh, this, yeah. this was an album. That one was an album. Yeah. You know, the album was called, and the song was called Rest in Peace. And he used Lullaby, go figure, Lullaby, not even my song, an instrumental. I saw the movie. I, yeah, I, that wasn't my song either. <laughs> I, I saw an instrumental and I recorded it the next day. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, body. I want to do my style, instrumental, yeah. wide lead, 
lullaby rolls very very well. Mm -hmm. Call the guys in, no rehearsal, no nothing. With those guys, you don't need no rehearsal. Uh, that gypsy woman on Fanya now is 150 bucks. You see, get the gold label is worth more. Yeah. The gold label? Yeah. Oh, boy. Yeah. Yeah. I saw somebody with a 78 That's a, from so, South America. Yeah. So that that forty five, the original forty five Gypsy Woman right. on Gold Fania, right, was different than the album track. No, there's a big story. Because it, the the forty five, you hear you you hear you tinkling on the on the piano, and I don't know if I heard that on the album. No, it's the same. But let me tell you what happened was, the song was first recorded with Al Santiago. All right, big story. Because when I went there, you know, Al was an eccentric guy, right? And I was young, but of course I was from the streets. I didn't take no shit from nobody. And what happened was, he had me in the studio, and when I looked in the booth, the engineer was this little kid, 16 years old, was Willie Colon, as the engineer, all right? Really? And I'm saying, what the hell is this guy doing? So I said, well, maybe I don't know, because he had just recorded Willie, right, with a Jazzy. So he's so and I heard about stories about Al Santiago, Legre, all that. So he's starting over again. So he goes and he records me and he says, Okay, have the band play. So he tells me, hit it. I say, one, two, three, four, things and stop. Do it again. I tell you not. That sucker made me do that song 48 times and stop me every time after one. After a while, I said, wait. I said, I'm going to get my gun. I'm going to blow your damn head. Don't play with me. What the hell are you doing? So finally, said, oh, no, 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 no. We had to just had to get that right. The guy was eccentric, right? Uh, what he did was we finally recorded. So it was done at a very slow speed. Even mm -hmm. words were used in there that you never heard on the original recording because we actually say she smoked pot, right? But then when he never released it, and I had to go and commandeer my record at his record shop in Westchester Avenue. Say, give me my shit, I'm not playing. Give me the recording. So we took the recordings from him, and that's when I made the deal with Fania, and we recorded it, it became much more up tempo. This, and it was a different this, Listen to this. This story. Bobby Marine is in the studio. Who? Bobby Marine is yeah. in the studio. And, uh, and he gets a call. Uh, from somebody up in Friday and say, listen, I have some bad news for you. <laughs> we signed Willie Colon, and, uh, you know, so uh, he's not going to be coming to the studio. So Bobby said, Bobby said, no, well, you know, Jesus, I'm sorry here, but, well, but at least I'm okay with Joe. He said, I got some more bad news. <laughs> Joe ain't coming either. <laughs> it was for Decca Records. Uh, he had got his brother, who was in the business working for Decca, and he was following me everywhere I went. He knew that you was a woman was going to be a hit. Right, 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 right. And he said, he said, I got a deal for you at Decca Records. And I'm saying, Decca Records? Wow. That's, you know. I said, yeah, yeah, OK, I'll be there. And the next thing I knew, I was signing with Fania Records. And they almost had a heart attack when I didn't show up. Yeah. And that's, well, that's a that. true story. Yeah, that's true. Sure. I want to ask you a question. Mm -hmm. uh, one, one thing, going back to your very early statements mm -hmm. about the band, yeah. About the, the being schooled by learning from the street. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, so, uh, uh, was, was Johnny Cologne's music school up and running at that time? No. Actually, and this is history. Nobody knows this. The first school was opened up by Joe Batan and Tito Ramos. We didn't know what we were doing. We got Steve Pullian. I don't know if you remember him, the trombone player. He had an office on Broadway, and we convinced Dick Ricardo Sugar to advertise our school, which was called LSA School of Music, Latin Soul Arts School of Music. So Tito would teach dance, and I would teach a little theory, right? But we used his office, but we couldn't pay the rent. So Steve would come up to us every day. Look, how many students you got? We had maybe two or three students, but it was all the way down in Midtown, and we did the best we can, but we had the concept and the idea. Johnny, Nobody was doing it. When did you know? Johnny open the school? Because Charlie he really, came much later. He, he really did it. I'm yeah, right. he did it. Yeah, no, he became so, very but, successful. But, 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 so they had nothing to do with your your band, young band, Joe Batan being learning how to play music. Oh, no, no. Matter of fact. When do you he, think he, he started? He started before me. Matter of no, fact. No, what no, do you the mean? school. I mean the school. Oh, the school. Yeah. 
Oh boy, he started that after Rough. after he started stopped playing a little. He was always playing, but you know, he wasn't playing as much. Right. Then he had time to run the school. So, you know? so what are you talking about? Oh boy. I'm not sure. I don't want to say it'd be a rough. It's a rough. I can't say it's a rough because I don't it's remember. Is it eighties? I'm trying to 70s? think what I was doing during that time. Yeah, it could have been you know, could have been the eighties. We got you seven. We got a seventy-eight with you and Ralphie. Yeah, and that I know because I could have. So it was after that. Up. Was it after that? You yeah, don't know. It was after. Uh, let's see. I forget what songs were out at that time. Because he, he was a very important thing. He really ran the school right. Joe said it. Yeah, yeah, Joe yeah. yeah. He, he did a good school? job. Who's that? Johnny Cologne. Johnny Cologne. He had he had the, the well, best he got the space. Teaching. Yeah. He had somebody to write the proposals. Yeah, yeah. And he got the musicians. Yeah. Which was perfect. At I mean, Nicky was teaching the bars. All the good guys were teaching. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. How about Bobby Rodriguez in La Compania? Another story. Yeah. Bobby lived on 116th Street. I love the way they do Sunday kind of love. Yeah, we well, oh, do it all the time now. Isn't that yeah. great? When, when, we, when he was 13, he had a band already with his brothers. How does that happen? He was, he was, he was a, he was a protege. In school and music, he played all the instruments. Yeah, right. Did he? I didn't know yeah, that. he did. I'm telling you because I know I gave okay. Bobby his first flute. All right. Let me tell you the story. If you let me finish, he lived at 116th Street. He was a tag musician, very quiet guy. He was not in the in crowd. All right. As to say, he would come around. He'd sit in with this guy, but he had his own band before everybody. Right in our neighborhood. Bobby Rodriguez, not no, the Robert Rodriguez Orchestra. And they used to play At all. 13 years old. Yeah, but it wasn't his band, it was his brothers, but there was the family, right? They played sax. I didn't even know what planet I was on. I was Neither. 13. Neither. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. So they, they always played without a piano player. And this music was like playing like they played Tito Rodriguez and all the big band stuff. So what is this guy doing? And they said, wow, these guys are terrific. So they all had been going to school and studying the music. For some reason, he was able to organize this band from the guys that went to school, right? Even Jimmy Sabatier played, Junior played with them. Uh, Gano, the Albino that sang, sang with them. So a couple of times, I only knew a few chords, and he would tell me, oh, do this or do that. I would sit in. So that whole summer, I played with them. The first band I ever played with, and, and they would play for the Apartments of Parks. And you know, I never got paid because they used to mail the checks. I don't know where the hell they were mailing mine because I never got one. And uh, that was my first experience. And then finally, when I started to do my own band and I was making much more progress than Bobby did, actually recording before him and he was into music and hearing, he started playing with me. Oh, really? Yeah, he, they, they all started playing with me. Eddie Hernandez from the Bad Street Boys, mm -hmm. Toti Negron that played with uh, Bobby Rodriguez. Uh, all those guys played with me. Right? They were my band. And so what, what happened was uh, he had no flute, and I had a flute, and I gave him his first flute. And uh, he went on to play. He played, a, he played on Shaft. He played on all my early recordings. If you see him, Milton Alvino, that was also in his band. And um, the rest is history. You know, after that, when I stopped playing, he, they organized their own band. And they called it the Bad Street Boys. They started recording with Fonda, and the rest is history. You know, I always loved the his version of Sunday Kind of Love. Yeah. And, oh yeah, and what happened? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. that, I love that song. Oh yeah, because yeah. he fact, sings it in Spanish and in English too. Yeah, you know, is stop he it. Oh, no, he's not singing. Who? Bobby singing? No, 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 no. The guy he just died. I forgot his name. Those records are worth money too. Yeah, Bad Breath. Okay. Remember Bad Breath? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those songs are worth a lot of money now. Mm -hmm. You know? The, the big hits are not worth the money. It's the real ones. Right, right. Your biggest records, Joe, are not, it's not, are not, they're worth the least. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a song well, that he's talking about that he loves mm -hmm. that, that, that that are rare. Well, New Jersey Turnpike that I produce. Right. Right? That's got to be worth a lot of better, by, by direct records. That was my label also. Tell me about the 125th Street Candy Store. <laughs> that was, uh, what you call this book? Uh, what's his name? Chuck Fly wrote that, right? Yeah. They sure. they actually hung out at this candy store? Is that yeah, true? Yeah, that's the name of the group. 
I think. Someone told me that they, they actually hung out at some candy yeah, store. Yeah, I was gone by that. I yeah, no, no, no. He got the group. I don't know if he put them together or what he did. And they used that name, 125th Street Candy Store. Chuck Fly. They, I never one or two of their records are worth a lot of money. Yeah? yeah oh, yeah. 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 There's one. There's one that's, that's probably worth about four or five hundred bucks. Wow. Because, I mean, they didn't make a lot of those records. No, 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 no. You no, know no, what I mean? No, no, no. Listen, Joe mentioned something about a gold 78 from Fadia. Are the 78s worth any money? No. No? Nothing. How come? Wow. They're older than 45. 45 is what's worth money now. And they're vinyl. Something's wrong, right? Yeah. I mean, the only the only 78s that are worth a lot of money are like the, the real old blues 78s. Or like Paramount Records and wow. stuff like that. They go back to like the 30s, and those are worth a lot of money. So 45s are worth, and that you know the, the vinyl on on the 78s are better than, than, the, than the, the product of the 45. If, if you get a clean 78, there's no better sound. Like so, something like Joe's gold, nothing. What Joe mentioned the a 78. Yeah, Joe mentioned these. Are so I've awesome. never a guy seen brought it to a collector's thing, a guy from South America. I've never seen and I, that. And I said, wow, you would give that to me. But yeah, he was holding on to it. I said, wow, I've never even seen it. I know it. Because what happened, Jerry had some kind of deal with, I don't know, Fuentes Records in South America, one of them big companies that's still in existence. And they were releasing Fania stuff from South America. Oh, yeah. And I've I, seen a lot of your yeah, albums from yeah. all different yeah, countries. Yeah, all legit. Yeah. Not, not, it was not. legit. Yeah, yeah, yeah a deal. Said. Jerry made license deals. Yeah. We all did. We yeah. all His biggest one was uh, um, uh, Ernesto Alwi. That was a Venezuelan company called. Uh, yeah, Venezuela. Uh, that was the yeah, first yeah, deal he made. Yeah, yeah. But that was, uh, Joe, when he retired, that's where the big hit came from. He got millions from Ernesto Alwi. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then he worked it off with the uh, Ernesto knew the label. He knew what it could do. He, yeah, he had all of South America. Uh, something Iglesias, the Venezuelan label, something Iglesias. Pablo Iglesias? No, not Pablo. No, no, the label, the name. Oh, Iglesias, I remember him. Yeah, yeah, so, so. Anyway. Yeah, that's how he was cool. big in Jerry's life. Very big. Yeah, so, I, I, don't know if, I don't know if he's still around, but my, my buddy Gregory Porter. Yeah. He's one of the biggest vocalists in the world today. Yeah? Jazz vocalist. I used to go see him. Years ago at St. Nick's Pub up in Harlem. Okay. Where Charlie Parker used to. He, Charlie Parker uh, recorded an album. What there. street is that on? It was on 140. Wow. 8th, 7th Street. Oh, so that's up there near the Savoy. Yeah. And it's gone now. They closed it. They okay. closed it. But it was, there, it was there for years and years. And I met Gregory Porter. I don't know if Gregory is still in the house, man. Yeah, you were getting around. Huh? But, but, but Gregory. Um, that's that it was a tiny yes, people saying they love you. Yeah, they, these are all yeah, loves. Oh, these I are all love. Right. Everybody loves you. Hey, hey. But and you, and you don't have no bump. You got no bump. No. Ain't so, nobody loving you. No, 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 they don't love me today, man. I got a big mouth. <laughs> it's young, it's young, yeah, yeah, probably. So let me tell you the story about Gregory <laughs> Porter. I, I used to go up to this club, St. Nick's Pub, on uh, Friday nights because they had this little jazz group I playing up there, too. right? Bubble Lady, I love you too. <laughs> Look at that. Bubble lady? Well, maybe bubble guy. I'll go. Either yeah, way. but be careful there, bro. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, who yeah, you tell yeah. you who you love. I don't have That's to right. do that, but I'm 82. Ain't nothing happening here. No <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I went up there, and you remember Lonnie Liston Smith? Yeah, yeah. He did that song, Expansions. Yeah, yeah. Great yeah. instrumental, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, his brother, Donald, used to play up at St. Nick's Pub all the time, and he had a little jazz quintet. These guys could have been playing at the Blue Note. They could have been playing anywhere, man. But I, I used to ask Donald, how come you guys don't, like, go out and, you know, try and make a career? I said, ah, man, we like to keep it real, you know. I said, well, keeping it real. I said, they just didn't care. They just wanted to be left alone and play their music right, up at St. Right, Mike's Park. Right. Yeah, yeah. And I used to go up every Friday night. Eventually, the place caught on, right? These Japanese people, I don't know how they find these spots, but the word got out, yeah. and before you know it, there's these buses of Japanese ah. tourists pulling up in the front of St. Nick's Pub. The place held 
60 people. Wow. Before you know it, you couldn't walk in there. It was jam-packed. The place was like Sylvia's in Harlem. You know yeah. what I mean? Well, so chairs with chairs yeah. were ripped. Pictures on the wall, crooked. Like Sanford and Son. You know what I mean? But <laughs> packed. To see, and these guys, like I said, they could have been playing at the Blue Note. They were fantastic jazz musicians. So one night I'm there with my friend Susan, and I see this guy, and it's very crowded in there. So this guy's like standing next to me, and he's like right on top of me, you know? So I'm getting ready to say, yo, you know, mm -hmm. you want to sit on my lap, you know? But I didn't say anything because my friend Susan's going, don't say anything. You don't want to start trouble up here, man, you know? <laughs> what was your name, Monty Rock? Gregory Porter, oh, Monty hey. Rock. Monty Rock used to come into Colony all the time in the 70s when he had discotheques and the sex olets. Yeah. Get yeah, dancing yeah. on Chelsea Records. That was a big hit. I, I used to hang with Ida Puente, who now is Ida Carlini, on Facebook, and Monty Rock. And uh, when I was a young kid, like, yeah. Was, he was in, uh, I think he was in, uh, what do you call it? I love that one. Saturday Night Fever. Yeah, was he? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, he was in the movie. He was the disc jockey in the club. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. anyway, let me finish the story. Okay. So this guy's standing next to me. Big <clears throat> dude, man. Six five. It's the summertime. He's got an overcoat on. Oh, and a hat. And I'm saying, this, this guy's burnt out, man. Yeah. You know, I'm yeah, right, right. not saying nothing to this guy, right? <laughs> right? So I'm talking to Susan. Next thing I know, he's up on stage singing. I thought he was like someone who just wandered in. It was like, you know, he gets up and he's singing uh, uh, the song he did wrote called 1960 what? 1960 who? Guy blew me away. Wow. Blew me is, away. Is that this guy Porter? Gregory Porter, right here. Yeah. I don't know if he's still in the house, Gregory, but... Uh, did he ever take the coat off when he was singing? Yeah. Thank yeah. God. Okay, yeah. Thanks. Well, you know what happened? He wears this hat. And I always wanted to ask him why he wore the hat, but I think he had some kind of he was in some kind of fire or something like that. And so he just wears the hat all the time. Wow. But he did, um, he, he sang a song that he wrote and he sang um, <clears throat> Red Clay. I think that was a Freddie Hubbard song. So like really hip stuff, right? So when he came off the stage, I said, you're going to be big, man. You know, I said, you're really going to be big. And he was selling CDs out of his pocket in his coat, right? So I bought a CD from him and I said, listen, I manage Colony Records, man. I said, I want to help you sell the CD. I said, come down to the store. Bring me some CDs, man. I'll help you sell it. You know, so he came down. We became friends. Long story short, I don't know how many Grammys he has now. Wow. And he's touring the world. <laughs> I, I went to see him last year uh, and the year before at Carnegie Hall. Wow. And he turned that place into a church, bro. Ooh, you know. Man. Unreal. The guy is fantastic. I don't know if you're still there, Gregory, but if you do, we love you, man. I love you. You're absolutely fantastic. Who you know? love with, with Look at all this man. love. Love. Let's yeah, mention, mention some names here. Hey, listen, you guys, if, if you have any questions that you want to ask Joe or Harvey, type them in and uh, see if we can get an answer. Stephen, I want to make a comment. Uh, in the Village Voice, before they went out of business, they did a survey on the on the health of jazz in New York. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm, I'm going to ask you a question. Take a guess. How many jazz fans, serious jazz fans, do you think live in New York that support the music? Go to the clubs and, and you know, not just say, I love jazz. Go to the clubs and buy the <clears> records. How many? I would say not that many. I think a lot. I, no, I, mean, I know a lot of people. A lot of people donate to BGO. Remember what like we're saying. We're saying the support. Let's go to those clubs, Blue Note, Birdland, or Vanguard, whatever, and buy the records. Six hundred. See, I told you. It was out of money. Joe, can you imagine in a city of eight million, nine, ten million? Yeah. Six hundred pure jazz fans. Yeah. Now, now, what do you think keep the? What do you think keeps those clubs alive? What he's saying, the Japanese. Tourists. That's what keeps those clubs alive. Yeah. Well, if you go to the Blue Note, it's nothing but tourists. Yeah. Because tourists. number one, they charge a fortune. That's amazing, Joe. They charge a yeah, fortune. Yeah, but you in. know, like I did some research, right? And like, if I had to start all over, right? The one thing that I would commandeer 
is the press and the marketing part, right? Because forget about the talent. The talent ain't going nowhere if it's not getting the exposure. So radio is a big key. And if you ain't got nobody bouncing that stuff on there consistently, that's why they got drive time and all this stuff. Because now the radio in every part of the country is different. When I went to San Francisco, I fell in love with the radio because I heard stuff that I never heard in New York. Right. Right? I heard jazz. I heard mixing. And the music was like fresh and new to me. So a lot of my ideas changed about how I adapt to my music. New York was like that, but not anymore. No. No. We've lost he, a lot. He, yeah. So there's a very few stations left. Latin music is dead. Right. There's it's nobody just, following radio what the people want. Really. Yeah. Yeah. Was, you know what I'm saying? You just took the words out of my mouth, Seth. Right you know? now. Yeah. That, radio. That's the boss. Yeah. 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 I mean, you know. Radio, radio means something, but not nothing like what that means. I'm, the yeah. what generation? Not yours and mine's. The one. This, See, this, this one. This one. We're yeah. not in that generation now. No, no. We're living in that generation. <laughs> See, that's what we're, we're living, living there, in. but we ain't doing it. Okay. Oh, they got kids up there. Consistently, twenty four seven, doing this. Okay. Right. right, they're the ones that are uh, got the pulse of the music and what's going to happen. They're the ones that are going to make it turn and move because a guy that's in marketing says, "Well, who's going to buy my records?" That's the audience that he's going to go out to. He's like, right. "I ain't going to be with a Harvey or and Joe Batan. They don't even get out of bed. They ain't going to buy no records, so they're going to waste the dollars marketing to us." Right, right. You're going to get those kids that are consistently on chat. Facebook, Twitter, and all that stuff. And that's how you're going to make your money. So if you had to educate anybody to start in the industry, in the book, you said, first, learn your computer. Learn social networking. Because that's where it is now. Yeah. It's all different. You know? Yeah. But the, the big stations today are, are like, you know, like B, we have BGO, the jazz station. And, you know, they don't really play... No, it's free. It's also, they want free. It's you know, a, it still slows your music. Yeah. But it's but the, the, the listenership compared to an internet show, wow. <laughs> what are you doing, Alfie? Yeah. Wow. Wow. But not only that, I got to tell you, I listen to BGO, great station. But they are strapped in what they play. You see, people don't realize that a lot of genres of music spread out. But they're not, they're not uh, satisfied to go outside the line. No, they have a to format. Bring that, they have a format, Joe. Right there, so what? They, but what they, audience are they reaching? Yo, they're thing, not reaching everybody. Same thing like the country stations. They got a format. Yeah, but that should, that's got to change. No, no. no listen, if, if, yeah, they, if they do it, we'll do it. There's no reason for those kids to go to VGO. They got other ways to hear the music. Listen to this, Lord. Okay? I, I learned this in California from Ray Andrade. Chicano, they got my record played on K-Day. He said, Joe, let me explain this and never forget it. He said, the airwaves belong to the people. And once, by FCC ruling, that that radio station doesn't conform to the community, you can complain. But how many people in New York know that ruling? Nobody complains. You can call up the station, hey, wait a minute. You keep playing that. I want to hear some of this. You're not coming to my community. How dare you bring all that and stuff and you're only catering to a certain percentage of the population. They're wrong, you see? But if you can stay by the artist, oh, what are you going to do? That's the way it's been. Baloney! That's what activists are for. Right. That's what you make, you put a fire under your butt to change things. It's never too late to make change. That's why you go in politics and you want to change the offices because you're not satisfied. So radio, I'm not satisfied. You might be satisfied. You might be satisfied. But there are a lot of people out there that say, Shh, I ain't listening to that radio. Let me go to the internet the station, and hear what I want to hear. Right? right? The stations for them, where they could go to the internet. Yeah, but you don't have to be that way. There's a ruling it's gotta be by that FCC. Way. Because certain no. messages turn into certain stations. No, no. See, on, there's, there's rules for the FCC. You have to. So let's try to program your program to listen for for the community. And I'm telling you, Latin music has been way behind because if they would have done anything way back, they would have had health care yeah. for all these musicians. Half of them are dying and they got to do yeah. benefits to keep alive, to bury themselves. Right. Why do I got to right. go outside 
to uh, Joe Blow to pay for my funeral costs, and I sold millions of records. Come on, don't tell me it ain't got to change. Or do we got to satisfy? No, the pacifists say, yeah, we can't do nothing. You know, boom, boom. No, we had that in the Holocaust. Don't all right, already. Don't you know, know, we just took it. Hey, I'm telling you. We were pacified. You let them there and he ran all over everybody. Yeah, yeah. They're running over people here yeah, now. I know, I and just, this know, program gives you a vehicle you. to wake up people. Yo, and not to be a reactionary just, and go back yo, into yo, history yo, and be yo, satisfied. Yo, 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 okay. yo, an artist is not an employee of the record company. They're a private contractor. The artist is supposed to go out and take that money that he's making, that he, if he was getting paid, and buy his own health care, and buy his own insurance, and invest his own money, you see, and, and think of the future. You said it just yourself, Harvey. Paid. You sound like the record company executive, and I sound like the street guy yeah, that's trying to get ahead. Well, you That's the difference. I tell you, it's two different worlds. No, no, no. And I understand it. I respect you. No. But I could hold my opinion. I don't agree with yeah, you. Yeah, but, right? But, that, oh, yeah. this is what the artist got to do. But listen, Baloney. But, Joe, we're too, if we would have thought that, we would have still been in Joe, slavery. Joe, we're, Joe, we're, right? We're no way, man. You ain't Joe, chaining me down. Joe, Joe, we're 100 years old. And, and it's still never changed. Don't speak for yourself, and man. I'm 92. And that's still never changed. <laughs> and that's still never changed. <laughs> Well, if somebody, if you're not an employee of somebody and you can go and, and go to a, another company and you have the freedom to do whatever you want, you're not an employee of the record company. They don't, you don't get health care. You don't get paid vacation. You don't get this year because you're not a fucking employee. But what is that got to do? You're a private contractor. What does that got to do with making change, Harvey? Don't, they, they, they become an employee. They, no, they, 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 no, the record, the record company ain't giving you a gift. You know, you got to be happy if they pay your money. You see, you, you, you're talking from the standpoint of an executive, not, not from an artist. What's, what's, All right? what's you, real? Can't, you can't serve two masters. One side you got to be on, brother. No, you know what you can't be? You can't be, you can't be a private contractor and an employee at the same time. Who said time. so? You can't be. Well, who said that? I say it. Okay. <laughs> then you go right. by your rules. I go by, I can do whatever I want to do. Right. Okay, so, so it's... it's Everybody else in the world against you. No, no, you're trying to get them all on your side. I ain't doing nothing. This is the way it is. No, that's the same thing that Trump hey, does. How, how, the same how thing. You doing with he health? says everybody. How, how you doing with everybody health follows me, how, how, how and you, it's not true. How, how you doing in your health care? Paying your rug, the guys that play with you, health care. What do you mean? You giving the guys that play with you health care? I pay them. They don't. I pay them their money what they they deserve. Ah, uh, ah, uh, yeah. uh, Okay, yeah. well, I rest my case. Well, what does that got to do with the price of the It's the same thing as a record company. You make them records, they pay you. You got to do your own thing. The same thing with the, the thing is, the, the record companies ain't paying me. Okay, okay. Now, don't let me go into that because then you're they're probably coming to it. arrest you in a, in a little you, while. You, you right. already went into it. You already went into okay. it. Okay. And I All agree right. with that. Hey, no, look. We got a question here. Yeah. My buddy, uh, Mr. Ra. On the march on Ra. What's up, bro? He wants to know, is there a story behind Afro-Filipino and peace, friendship, so, and so, solidarity? Oh, big story. Every, everything that Joe Batan does has got a story. I'm sorry, but that's the way it is. It's in my book, excellently, uh, what I just finished called Speedology. But nevertheless, Afro-Filipino was done when I looked at myself in the mirror and I said, who the hell am I? Right? I knew how I grew up. I knew what I did. Uh, I didn't have a biased body in my blood. But I said, you know, I got to identify myself. But the thing is, I always thought of myself as an American living here in this country, right? But I had to take notion that my mother was black, my father was Filipino, but my heart was Latino, right? So I said, well, let me name an album, right, about depicting who I am. And I thought of the name Afro-Filipino. Now, that was done in the 70s. To this day, which I'm sort of proud of, because there was never a Filipino artist coming out and saying that they were Filipino, right? I, I seem to think like I was probably one of them. What it also did that I found out was, you got to understand in most cultures, if you're not pure this or pure that, a lot of times you're not accepted. Right. So I don't look Filipino. It ain't my fault. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but, the, but the fact remains, when I did Afro-Filipino, I found that there were thousands and thousands of different sects of Filipinos around the world. There were Asian Filipinos, there were Chinese Filipinos, 
There were Greek Filipinos, I mean Tunisian Filipinos. So they were starting to be accepted. Not like the old school family tradition. Oh, he's not pure this, so he must be a mutt, right? And then of course, the first time I ever played in the Filipino uh, establishment, they told me stop playing so loud. And I looked at them like they were crazy. What are you talking about? He said, that music is too loud. But of course, that was the culture back right. then. A lot of the nationalities, when they came to this country, they were passive. They accepted what they get because they didn't want to get kicked out, right? They got into the little hut. They got whatever education they got. And they became nurses or doctors or something like that. And they stuck to themselves. They didn't support or got out of their community. We have this problem on the West Coast. When I go to play, and it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a black African show. The supporters are Mexican. 95%. Right. Because that's the population. No, that's not the population. Are you in, kidding me? In, in, if you go LA, see, if, no, no. If you go see Snoop Dogg, the place is packed with African Americans. Of course, you'll find Chicanos there okay, also. Okay, okay. And, and, and black. But what I'm saying, they support the music. All right? And what I'm saying is, a lot of these uh, nationalistic groups don't party together. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, unfortunately, that's the way it is. Well, it shouldn't be. Music is a universal and, and, language. And, and, Latino, and Latinos are worse. The worst you do. We, Latinos go somewhere, they make their own restaurant, their own clubs, True. their own radio stations. Mm -hmm. Come on. Right. True. You know? And, and you know, it should be and, opened and, up for everybody. And, 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 and there's a double reason. Number one, number one, um, Watch out. <laughs> they're not being, no, no, no. Number one, they're not being, they don't feel like they're being accepted, which they're, they're right. So they yeah. do their own thing. They don't want to fight it. Yeah. And, 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 uh, because Joe, mm -hmm. Joe, until this huh? Trump came in here, mm -hmm. nobody had to worry about getting kicked out. They had to worry about the other country. They had to worry about being accepted. No. Listen, no. my father changed the name. He wanted to be accepted. <laughs> His name was Harry Obrusky. He changed, uh, he changed the name to Avern. Not me. Well, a lot of people okay. change their name. He didn't want to be Russian. It wasn't popular to be Russian. He wanted to be American. He wanted to be accepted. Unfortunately, people, in this world, people, sometimes that's what you got to do to get where you got to well, go. Well, he thought that. Joe know? don't think that. And maybe Joe's right. The point, the point is that that's what he wanted. And, he, and, 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 uh, um, and, and I don't think people should have to change their name to be accepted. I don't, have to, I don't think people have, should have to change who they are to be accepted. But that's the way it is. We're, we're all we're looking to little groups. Hey, That's got to change for this country to really... We could just join them. Oh, Warren. Oh, Warren. Warren. Hey, Warren. Hey, Warren. Hey, Warren, how you feel, buddy? <laughs> Warren. The great Warren Tesoro in the house. Yeah. Right, hey. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Warren, Joe's beating me up. Yeah, beating him up. <laughs> <laughs> uh... Come on, Warren. <laughs> yeah, Warren was going to come over today. I don't know what happened to him. Uh, yeah, a lot of people, man. A yeah. lot of people. Sam Cully was tuned in from the Diplomats. Oh, okay. Sam Here's yeah. a heart. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. Diplomats. Nice yeah, show. Right. Nice show, man. So we've been doing this almost three and a half hours. Wow. That's right. That's right. Bobby yeah. talks a lot. <laughs> That's, right. That's right. I did a half hour. <laughs> Joe, so, give, give Joe the three. <laughs> so this is this is um, this was a lot of fun, man. This it really good. was. It was it's just, and you know, you know what it was. And it wasn't even a show. It was just three guys talking. Right, just friends hanging yeah, out talking, yeah. man. Whatever just, came to our minds, we didn't hold back nothing or whatever. You know. I didn't tell nobody how cheap Joe was, <laughs> and, and that he owes me a couple of thousand dollars <laughs> for so many years with that interest, I could retire. Yeah, yeah. I didn't say that. Yeah. I would say that because I love you. But you know what? You you got to take it down to the end. And, and uh, it's a thing that I found out in my old age that uh, I could have never did anything without the big boss. And he's the one that controls my destiny. And I, I don't want to lose sight of that. I ain't got nothing really That's right. bad to say about anybody. I forgive everybody uh, in my and lifetime. You you and I hope they forgive me for, for right. my trespasses. Right. I, uh, I want to move on. I want to find the light. And uh, I want to inspire other people to do good things in life. So if you get a chance, <laughs> it's like an advertisement. Wait for my book. It's coming out called Speedology, and you'll 
know more about my history and my steps. Where am I going to be able to get it? Well, right now, we're hoping to finish it by the time uh, we return to the Smithsonian. So it's going to be reviewed uh, this week. Okay. And of course, they probably want to put some spicy things in there because I didn't. I left out a lot. Okay. But uh, I'm excited about it because I think it should be a book for every youngster that has aspirations of doing something with their life. It shows you the ups and downs and the struggles that you might encounter, and that sixth sense that you need to survive in this world. And you can then you can make it. Yeah. Well, yeah, as long as you, you got the big boss. No. First is the big boy. Once you got the big boss. You can do anything. Is that going to be distributed only on online? Only God knows. Okay, possible. 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 Everything's going to so, happen. Or possible. Okay. Nothing will happen. Right. If I live the right way. And no, something right will happen. Something will happen. Something will happen. happen. Mm -hmm. two, so tune in. Tune in to Steve. And when Joe's ready, he'll, he'll make an appearance again without me. And, <laughs> he'll, and, he'll, and, and you'll know the book is ready. So, so Anima Sean says, thank you, Joe, for the answer about Afro-Filipino. Warren says, what happened to you at the church today? I was there for half an hour. Uh, I stayed for the whole service, and you didn't show up. And I left. Once they started uh, giving the host to people, you know, I got up. I paid my respects. I left. We're talking about my friend Sal Mondrone, who passed away this week. Sorry. He was uh, uh, a huge music fan, uh, knew everything there was to know backwards and forwards wow. about doo -wop. He was a huge doo -wop fan, That's man. the only guys, kind of guys you know, Steve. Right. He, <laughs> he actually interviewed uh, Rudy West from the Five Keys. Wow, that goes way back. Yes. The Five Keys? In the Apollo, man. I remember he, the 50s. He, yeah, no, this, Sal was an amazing cat, man. He really knew his stuff. And he was one of the well, only doo-wop guys. You close your eyes? Yeah, close yeah. your eyes. Oh, yeah, I man. remember to this day. My saddest hour. Yeah. You know, they were on the Where were they from? Uh, I think they were from, uh, Warren, where were the Five Keys from? I think they were from, uh, Virginia, maybe? Yeah. I'm not sure. Tell me where they were from, Warren. Warren no, knows where they were from. Manhattan, but, uh, no, 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 no. Reggie, my friend Reggie out in Chicago says, come back on the show to debut the book, Joe. Yeah, okay, okay, I will. Joe, uh, Cassandra mm -hmm. says, thank you, Joe and Harvey. Very informative and never a dull moment. Uh, Reggie says you should make this happen at least twice a year. Truly enjoyed learning. Someone's thanking me for the interview. You're welcome. Cynthia, my, my good friend Cynthia, she posts the greatest music, man. She says, bravo from the Facebook music group's queen. <laughs> That's right. Warren wants to know if it was Kenny Seymour singing with you on... Uh, with me. That's what Javier heard. Kenny, Kenny Seymour is singing on about... 95% of the hobby of Vern does the records. He's my lead singer. God bless him. May rest and now he's singing. Is he? Is he? He's gone. He's, he's gone. gone? Yeah. 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 But he sang with, with the Imperials too. But his for son. Ohio, his Ohio. son is very successful on Broadway right now. Right. He's an actor. No, he's, he's a radio musical he's a director. director. Yeah, yeah. Musical director, conductor. Everything really? with the music. What's his mother's name? Mary, Mary, Mary Wilson. For what group? Oh, Mary Wilson. There you go. Mary Wilson. That's right. Uh, yeah, I was right. They were from Newport News, Virginia. Oh, okay, that's where my mother's from. I know. Wow. And, and that's where Ruth Brown was from Newport Get News, Virginia. Get out of here, really? Yeah, a lot of big talent coming out of that I city. I gotta look man. that up now. My buddy here's George Kerr. Hey, George. What's up, buddy? George says, good luck, Joe and Harvey. Best to you both and my dear friend Steve. George was here two weeks ago. We yes. did a great interview with George yes. all about his fantastic career. Uh... Let's see what else someone has to say. Uh, Reggie, Cynthia, thank you. It was Kenny Seymour. Cynthia says, bravo. Thanks for the answer, Joe. Yeah. So um, any more questions before we wrap it up? Wrap it up? Three, I think three and a half hours is, uh, I guess it's you, know, you know, we George and I did about two and a half hours. This one, I and 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 see, you see, we by the way, you said that we you we get, we get our health insurance, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> see? All right, we got it, we got it. okay, we finally got it. Yeah, okay, a, a, you got a free accessory.
fried ride home too. <laughs> yeah, you. <laughs> Warren says. <laughs> In case you forgot. <laughs> Warren says, loving you, cats. Uh, all right. Well, no more questions. Who else is? Let me mention some names here. Herman Rodriguez Bahandas. Oh, Hi yeah. to Joe. Hey, Herman. Okay. You know that hey, guy? Hey, looking for me. He's looking for you? Yeah, to get, well, me, get me some money. Well, here you are. Wow. Hey. Uh, who else? Mention some Herman, more names. Herman, bring, bring it to Ocean Park where I'll have Silver Joe. I'll get, let him get the money when I'm with him. <laughs> i got to show me how to get my song back, he said. Right? Charles McBurnett. He, is in the house. Joe, he lives close to him. He lives yeah. on his own park. My friend Cassandra, my buddy Nick, Nick Hogg, Ray McManus, Louise Murray from the Hearts. Oh, no, oh. Louise. I know Louise. You know Louise? Yeah. We Lu I don't Mary. know if you're still here, Louise, but she still sounds great. Yeah, she sure she does. She still sounds she great. On her, boy. You big old lump of sugar. Yeah. That was her <laughs> in that song, right? Louise, yeah. We yeah. did something like with uh, Augustine. At the uh, uh, yeah, right. Alex Augustine, Jackson. right. Yes, yeah. uh, Avery Pack has been in the house for a while. Thanks, Avery. Portland, Oregon. Lucy Roman Silva was here. Evelyn Glasgow, my old rhythm review buddy. Phoenix Phoenix. Robert Saff. Reginald from uh, Chicago. Charlie Schwartz. Who else? James Nelson, my buddy O. Henry. My old buddy James Nelson, oh Henry, great guy, Brooklyn boy, Brooklyn boy. Steve Thomas was in the house. All right, mm. well, we're gonna wrap it up. Yeah. Thanks for watching. Bye bye everybody. This was a great view. I uh, hope you guys learned something. I know happy I learned. Easter, happy Passover, yeah. everybody live and be well. Isn't that God Passover? Bless. I don't know. Yeah, I don't. Know. Yes, just yeah. it. It just passed. New comments. Let's see what's this. Warren wants to know who's buying the pizza. <laughs> you are. All right. Harvey's the closest thing to Italian. <laughs> right, That's right. 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 So uh, we're going to sign off now and uh, stay tuned for more up close and personal. I think the next one's going to be, uh, it's either going to be Warren Schatz or uh, Charles Kipps. Stay tuned. I'll let you guys know what's happening. So any last words from you guys? God bless. Grace, mercy, and peace. Okay. See you later, alligator. <laughs>